Hello everybody all around the world. Welcome to my live stream. I'm going to talk today about the Ineos Grenadier. I've been looking forward to this because of all of your reactions uh, have been fantastic. So, I mean, we got about 700 comments in the first 24 hours on Grenadier, which says to me that it's a, a subject that is popular. People are interested in it. I am interested in it and I had such a thoroughly good time with the vehicle and the opinions of the vehicle are so diverse that I thought I would create a, a live live show where you can throw some questions at me. I have some questions from my patrons which I'm obviously going to answer first but uh, please feel free to hello from Nam Marcus in Namibia. I love it when all all over the world people come and and, and meet me at my at, at my at my live shows and um yeah so <clears throat> answering the patreons first obviously but throw your questions at me and there is a super chat if you want to make sure that i see your questions then a donation is welcome because it comes up on my screen it says hey so and so donated five dollars and and then i will definitely get to your question because there are going to be a lot of questions but i'm going to give you my opinion those of you who are new to the channel and we got a lot we got over well over a thousand new subscribers because of the Ineos Granadia video uh, and some of you are new to my channel I'm going to give you a 30 second pitch of who I am I started overlanding when I was 12 years old bought my own four wheel drive when I was 22 did my first serious overland trip in Namibia in 1984 in the uh, video that I uh, released this week which was uh, it's one of the f of three videos of really old content that I created literally they're literally home videos re-edited for for YouTube and there's a clip in there of <clears throat> um, of me using a winch for the very first time and it's absolutely I, I, I fitted a winch because I, I was told you need a winch for Namibia and as it happened I did use the winch I didn't need the winch because the winch was actually useless I needed other stuff I was given information I was not given good information I was just given information you need a winch that was should not have been my priority but nevertheless I got stuck and f uh, my girlfriend filmed it and it's the genuine article so one of the first bits of footage I ever sh filmed of a four-wheel drive vehicle and I have uh, written 16 books on the subject at the moment. There are two of those books available on Amazon. Um, if you go into forexoverland.com, look under shop and you will find those links to the Amazon. Two books, one called Complete Guide to Four Wheel Drive, another book called Torn Trousers, which is an adventure travel story, or an award-winning, I should say, adventure travel story that Gunn and I wrote together. So those two are still available. Um, hello to your South African uh, family visit uh, visiting in Tasmania. Um, <clears throat> it's great stuff. Okay, Dewood, Minnesota. Uh, Faisal from Saudi Arabia, Yukon, Canada, India, <laughs> Los Angeles. Fantastic. Always love it. Karatha, WA. Uh, fantastic. Good morning from Kenya. Good morning from Perth, Stefan. So. Um, and I have uh, been four wheel drive has kind of been my my lifelong thing. It's what I do. And I had nine TV series that I produced in South Africa nine years in a row from 2006. And I believe I was the first in the genre to do solo expeditions for television. I actually did a show uh, shot it in 2008 and I drove right across the Kalahari in 2008, 2009, then 2010, I drove right across the Namib desert. I've done several trips in Australia, solo trips in Australia, and <clears throat> kind of started that, that genre. I believe I also was instrumental in starting the genre of troop carriers, the love of troop carriers. Being, they've become a bit of a cult. I think I probably had something to do with that. Um, certainly was one of the factors in getting the troop carrier to become such a popular vehicle for overlanding. I certainly wasn't the first one to go overlanding in troop carriers. It's not what I'm saying. I'm saying I was the first one to make it public in a troop carrier. And that was my first one, which I built in 2011, 2012 in South Africa and so on. And um, I now live in Western Australia and drive four wheel drives 
because I love four-wheel drives. I love four-wheel driving. I love building four-wheel drives. I made a business out of it, <clears throat> and the business supports me. And one of the, the I won't say it's a common con con comment on the the, the channel are, is uh, you know particularly with a grenadier uh, video uh, was people not understanding where I'm coming from and uh, misunderstanding what I meant when I said Ineos didn't want to give me a car to review. Now, 30 seconds on that. The reason why I felt, I felt, okay, that Ineos Australia were reluctant to give me a vehicle is that they had promised me a vehicle and were very nice about it. When I pressed them, they said, don't worry, we'll get you a vehicle. Meanwhile, where we actually filmed, very close to where we filmed the review in the dunes, they, were, they had a number of press vehicles that were using, demo vehicles that were using for, to take the public on joyrides and to get them to see and touch and feel the vehicle, which is a great idea. But those vehicles were here, the NWA, and yet I couldn't, they couldn't give me one. And so I made the assumption, and I had done, there'd been a lot of communications between me and the, the, the head of INEOS in Australia. And I assumed, I just made the assumption, I'm sorry, it's all bullshit, because you promised me and you're not delivering, so I must find another way, because I really, really wanted to review the vehicle. When I announced on my channel that I was going to review a vehicle, and that I had got one, I was then after that, I'd made the announcement, invited to a function where they would give me a vehicle for the day, but they would be with me. Not unlike the um, Aussie Arvos did a review where the CEO was in the back of the Grenadier while they were filming. How can that possibly be neutral? You know, I understand why you guys did it. And uh, it, wasn't all, it wasn't an altogether terrible review, but I felt it was a bit of a fluff, fluff piece. I, I felt it wasn't, didn't have a lot of meat in it. Well, how can you do that with the, with the car maker in the back of the car? You can't. It's not possible. So I wanted to be independent. I'm an independent. And the reason why I'm not invited to car launches, and for those of you who said, oh, Andrew's now pissed because he wasn't invited to the car launch. I'm not invited to the car launch because I'm not trusted. And what do I mean by trusted? Journalists are trusted when they say nice things. And they are not trusted when they are honest, which means there's a balance of good and bad. If I can't say what I want to say, I'm not going to bother saying anything. And it's been like that through my entire career. I've been fired from two magazines. I had regular articles for years for magazines. And eventually, and both of them, the editor said to me, Andrew, I'm going to have to let you go. And in both of them, I said, look, I love you. But my advertisers, no, I can't deal with. You can't say that. All you're allowed to say, for example, would be, and I didn't say this, but this was my interpretation. All you're really allowed to say is, I think the ashtray is a bit misplaced or the, um, the headlamps could be a little bit better. That was the limit. You couldn't actually say, like I said with Land Rover's Discovery 2, bloody hopeless that the fact that they took that centre differential uh, lock out and the four -wheel drive system on the Discovery relied on that centre differential. Now the differential lock was gone and it was replaced with the traction coil, which didn't work. It just didn't work. It was hopeless. And I said that and I was blacklisted from Land Rover. That was the end of it. Blacklisted. Uh, Ford, same thing. Blacklisted. The, v, the V6 Auto Ranger. I don't know what year I was. It was awful. So I made up with it because they had bought a cover from my magazine with the diesel version, which I actually thought was quite good. So I tended to fluff and pump up the diesel version review a little bit more to compensate for how bad I said I thought the V6 was. And, uh, well, they blacklisted me and they were very, 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 very ticked off with, and 
I don't suppose I, I blame them, but th then that was the end of my relationship with them because you, you're not allowed to be honest. If you want to be invited back, don't be honest. In other words, get, get a car from somebody else. And that's what I did with, with Grenadier. And the Grenadier story, when they started, I thought, what a great idea, because you know, most of you will know my opinion about the new Defender. It's, it's beautiful to drive. It's comfortable. It's, uh, technically, it's brilliant. But as a genuine adventure car, it's beyond hopeless. When it works, it's fantastic. If, it, if anything goes wrong, even a small things, Smink, it's so easy to be completely stranded because you need uh, the connection, an internet connection, and a, a laptop and the interface, and you need a programmer to, to sort out even minor problems, including an internet connection. Well, if you're in the middle of Sahara, Botswana, actually Botswana is actually not too, too bad, actually. It's better than internet connection in Botswana is better than it is in England. But the point is that if you want to go real adventure, you are going to be finding yourself in places where there's no internet connection. And here you've got a car that cannot be towed. It has to be pulled in a flatbed. You go on the Canning stock route. There is no, there is no um, internet connection on 99% of the Canning stock route. In fact, I'd say almost 100% of the Canning stock route. No internet connection. <clears throat> And we didn't have any Starlink when we did it. I've done it twice. Uh, what do you do? And you can't get a flatbed to come and rescue the Defender. You can't get a flatbed on the Canning Stock Route. You, you, so what do you do? Helicopter. Or abandon the car. It's probably cheaper to abandon the car. So that's why I say. So along comes Grenadier and says, we're going to do what Land Rover should have done. What a fantastic idea brilliant idea we're going to do what Land Rover should have done with the rebirth of Defender we're going to build another Defender in fact not only are we going to build another Defender we're even going to make it look like it Ineos said no it doesn't look like it come on just that just annoys me because you put the two side by side <laughs> and they look unbelievably similar so much so that they've even copied the driving position of Defender, one of the bad parts of Defender, which was the B pillar is right here. Okay, so when you off road and you're being thrown around, you're hitting a B pillar. Oh, like this all the time. Same with the Grenadier. It's not quite as bad. It's a bit further back, but only by a small amount. So because they've copied that silhouette. They copied the driving position. They haven't actually moved the driving position forward. Why didn't they do that? It was one of the major weaknesses of Defender. It never worried me when I was driving my Defender because the Defender was, um, uh, because I am not a particularly broad person. Guys who are thick set, big, big guys cannot stand the Defender because they can't drive like this. They have to drive leaning forward to give their shoulders space where the window is. OK, and if you look this way, all you see is B pillar. Same with the Grenadier. You look this way, all you see is green pillar like this. It should be back here. So it, it, they, they copied it. And some of those things that they copied. Um, why did they copy that thing that was actually quite bad? But other things that were bad, they didn't copy. And there, there was a Patreon of mine. I want to read his part of his comment. Um, his name is uh, David McRae. And he, he said, Like the new designer label Land Rovers, I have found it seems to be designed by people with too many toys at their disposal. Okay, Defender. They had too many toys at their disposal and they decided to go electronic. Because electronics can be amazing in what it controls. But for an adventure vehicle, a true adventure vehicle, it's su subject to a failure is catastrophic. So, so true with, with um, the same with, with Grenadier. They had too many toys, a little bit too many toys. For example, the overhead console, he said, is overdone 
and may cause difficulties for a roof conversion. I would say more than just difficulties for a roof conversion. I would say it might even be so complicated that would rule out a roof conversion. The, the reason why I was excited about um, Grenadier was that here was a vehicle that was, apart from the fact that it was supposed to, but hasn't really uh, replaced a fender, it was a solid axle, uh, four coil springs and ladder frame chassis, which means you can pump it up and the drive stain still remains solid. It's, it, it, it enables one to accessorize and tweak. Why the 70 series is so good. Why the Jeep, the Jeep, JK and JL series are the masters. Because they have ladder front. Yes, they have weaknesses and everything. We, all of the vehicles have weaknesses. The principle is solid axles on leaves, on, on coil springs, on a ladder frame chassis. Means dot, 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 dot. Whereas if you don't have that, your very, one is very much more limited. And that is why the INEOS was so exciting to me. Now the big, for me, the big problem with INEOS was that I said, hello Kuwait, I don't fit in a Defender, Mark. Uh, they also copied the lack of headroom. I never found my Defender had a lock, lock, lock a, a, a missing headroom, but I'm, I'm, I'm six, I'm 5'11", so. Um, there is already a roof conversion available. Got to see that. Um, definitely, definitely want to go and see that. Um, so those switches and things will make roof conversions more. So where are you going to put the switches? So where are you now going to put the switch that controls the differential locks? I don't have an answer. Hopefully the roof conversion people have an answer. I don't have an answer. What I'm saying is that it complicates things. The idea, as I said in the video, that there are pre-switches for wiring already around the car, I think is in principle is such a brilliant idea. Putting it up there on the roof, I think was again, kind of taking a little bit too far because A, it'll be expensive. Look how expensive that thing is. Come on, that's expensive. That thing that really appeals to the nine-year-old in all of us is really cool and nice but it's expensive it drives the price up so where are those switches going to be fitted can they be fit are there switch places in the dashboard that you could no there are not it reminds me of slight digression here new troop carrier new troop carrier has slightly different dash they've changed the switching the switching now in the old days, old days, <laughs> my V8 that I sold a month ago, you could just get a switch and just plug it in and just use it and just wire up to a relay and ta-da, you've got a switch. Can't do that anymore because all the switch holes, it's different. It's You can't do it anymore. Same with INEOS. You can't just, where do you fit a switch? Are they standard size switches? Can you get the switch? Are they easy to fit? Well, there's not much space. There isn't really any any space in an INEOS for your cell phone. Very minimal space in there for trinkets while traveling. It was one, a, 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 a criticism that I didn't mention on my video is that there's hardly anywhere to put stuff while driving. Hardly anywhere, really, you know. I've always complained that the troop carrier had such a terrible center console. Well, the new one, actually, they put in a decent, decent center console. No, it's not Land Cruiser 300, quality but it's still practical and useful which it's never been on a 70 series so <clears throat> um the the grenadier was poor in that regard i was surprised when i first drove it and where's my where's my cell phone gonna go oh i need to put it in there okay i'll slide it in there and then it kind of flops around a bit while you're driving and it's where else okay well i can bury it in the center cu cubby hole there is a usb charge point in the center curry hole, cubby hole good that makes a big difference because now i can charge my phone in there so that, that that's good so but i did find that was a bit of a but these are these are small things these are these are really small things um <clears throat> another um malgu pop top designed in australia being exported 
Okay, I'm going to have a look at Australia. Malgu in Australia make a conversion for the uh, troop carrier uh, in Western Australia. And I will go and have a look at that. So thank you, thank you for that, Paul. I will go and have a look at that. Um, used to get a serious tan on my right arm driving a Defender, my elbow sticking out. That's Lizio. Yeah, it's, it's, it's William. Rather. That, that's absolutely right. You, would, you, you, get, you get a trucker's, trucker's elbow. Exactly right. Um, but you got used to it. But big people didn't like Defender. And I think big people are probably going to find. But you know, here, here's the um, good comment. Ineos captured the right demographic to buy it. Okay, the wave is back. So let's talk about that demographic. I, I <clears throat> It's not a Defender. Defender was not a luxury four-wheel drive. Defender was a utilit primarily a utilitarian four-wheel drive, and that is not what Grenadier is. But here's another thought on that. Why didn't they do that? They probably had the idea. It certainly looked like they had the idea, and they have pushed that idea in the press. His own words, Radcliffe's own words, the spiritual successor to Defender. The spiritual successor means, well, what does it mean? To me, it means if I love the Defender, I'm going to love this. And that has not happened because it's too expensive and because of what day, was it David? Um, David McRae said, you had too many toys to play with and you went beyond yourself. You put in those Recaro seats. As nice as those Recaro seats are, they drove the price up. That roof lining and that drove the price up. Every little, the, the quality, I mean, I said in my video, I thought the quality of the finishings inside with a rarity, they were really good, solid, and everything about it was really good. Which meant my conclusion was it's actually not bad value for money. But don't call it a defender. The defender was good value for money for a completely different reason. Ineos has created a luxury four wheel drive with the uh, utilitarian underpinnings of the solid axles, etc. They have not built a utilitarian vehicle. Firstly, the reason why I know that is the price is too high. And secondly, uh, the smallest wheel rims you can get a 17 inch. I'm sorry, that's not utilitarian. What does utilitarian mean? It means a number of things. It means it's really going to be really, really good. It's going to be the best off road. Now, if you want to go good off road, you need high profile tires. Number one. You need large wheels with high profile tires. Large wheels alone, don't cut it. You've got to combine it with high profile. So when you let them down, you have a long flat area at the bottom for flotation. The bigger the rim, the smaller the profile, the shorter that stretch is, that footprint is. Okay, so you want also uh, for less developed countries, <clears throat> I break a rim, I break a tire, Highly unlikely off-road expeditions. Break a tire. So you need to replace the tire. 17 inch. In Australia, you'll struggle a bit to find 17. You will in some of the smaller towns. Sound finds it. You will find 16 inches everywhere. Even in the tiniest town, you'll find a 16 inch to fit your room. 17, not terrible. 18, more difficult. 20, forget it. So, that's wheels and tires, and you've chosen a 17 inch. Why? Because you were going for a market that is not pure, pure utilitarian. Because if you were, you would, be have, you would have 16 inch rims. The fact that you got steel rims as well as an option, great. Very good. Very good yeah, that you've got 16 inch, because that, that, that is part of that market. Ineos has made the noises about uh, attracting military and attracting um, non-governmental organizations. In my opinion, Grenadier is a non-starter for NGOs, and this is why. Apart from the fact you've got to compete with Toyota, who are specialists. 
They build vehicles just for NGOs that you cannot buy anywhere else in the world. Okay, Trippy is one of them with a particular engine and auto, uh, manual gearbox. Just for NGOs, nobody else. NGOs want the following. They want a vehicle that is able to withstand abuse because their drivers have, so many of them will have zero mechanical sympathy. And speed and performance is not a requirement. In fact, they don't want it. And the reason why, I'll give you an example. When Land Rover, very, very popular vehicle, up to about 1985-86 with NGOs, very popular vehicle. The reason, very good load carriers. They were as uncomfortable as you can imagine. Why is that a good thing? Because it means that the drivers drive more slowly. They don't drive so fast. So they come up with a rever revolutionary, at the time it was pretty revolutionary, uh, a very agricultural vehicle uh, with coil springs and solid axles. And I mean, I went and bought one and it was fantastic. I'd driven Series 2, seven, I'd driven Series 2 and Series 3 Land, Land Rovers in rough terrain. I know how uncomfortable they can be. Uncomfortable has a different meaning with those vehicles. Now you've got a vehicle that is comfortable. They use the same engines, similar engines. Uh, uh, they upgraded the, upgraded the diesel, I seem to remember. But anyway, point is that they were underpowered. Now along comes a still underpowered vehicle that is really comfortable over washboards and rough roads. So what happened? The NGO drivers started rolling their, def their defenders. They were, one, they were called 110s at the time. Started rolling them because they were driving too fast, because they were too comfortable. They didn't understand the use of the center differential lock. What's this f permanent full-time four-wheel drive system? What? They didn't understand it. They understood, clonk, four-wheel drive, clonk, two-wheel drive. They understood that. And if it had hub lockers, a lot of the Toyotas had hub lockers, understood that. Logic, four-wheel drive, lock the hubs. Now you've got this automatic four-wheel drive, permanent, oh, I'm in four-wheel drive. Oh, it's, oh, it's full-time four-wheel drive. Oh, I'm in four-wheel drive. You're not in four-wheel drive. You're getting drive to all four wheels, but that is not four-wheel drive. They didn't understand the difference. They didn't understand that to put it in a four-wheel drive, you need to lock that center locker. So there was education that wasn't there. So that is why, that is why the 70 Series Land Cruiser still has part-time four-wheel drive. Because NGOs want to understand, clunk four-wheel drive, Lock the hubs if there are none. In the new ones, it's got automatic. You don't need to lock the hubs, but you can if you want to. It's got an automatic system. It's actually better if you do, but still, they understand. It's leaf springs at the back, keep it a bit uncomfortable. Okay, and they're delivered with the 1HZ, very, uh, very underpowered uh, 4.2 diesel engine, which is uh, um, perfect for NGOs. Why? Well, it's exactly what the Ineos doesn't have. The vehicle can a be able to withstand a nonchalant and driving style and nonchalant maintenance. Oh, we better do a service. Is about the best you can get with many NGO fleets. Oh, when was the last time that was serviced? Is there a record? Well, in the fleets that are well managed, there will be a record. In those fleets that are not well managed, there will not be a record. Those engines do 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 30, 40, 50,000 kilometers between services. I'm sorry, that BMW engine is not going to cope with that. It's too fast, too powerful for the NGO market. So to, if you want to do an NGO version, you make it uncomfortable. You rip out all of that comfort. You put in very, very basic seats and you put in a basic diesel engine. The other part is spares. Any NGO organization, they'll say, I want a vehicle that has a, these two things, plus I, I need to be able to fix it. Anybody needs to be able to fix it in a workshop. If it's too complicated and I can't fix it in, easily in a workshop, then it becomes a liability. There were stories in the, in the 90s of um, US aid, I think it was. It was one of the big US um, philanthropic organizations supplying NGOs with vehicles. And they supplied a lot of... Um, 
uh, F-150s to various parts of Africa, and they just didn't last. And one of the reasons why they didn't last is they weren't they were they were beaten up because they weren't they didn't have the strength of the Land Cruiser in terms of that utilitarian basic easy to fix thing. But the biggest problem was they didn't supply spares with them, so a lot of them just broke and they couldn't be fixed because there were no spares. So they weren't valuable to the NGOs. So if you want a Grenadier to be suitable for NGOs, you put in a different power plant, you make it a manual transmission, okay, full stop. You have to be able to push it. When that battery goes flat, and it will go flat, you have to be able to push it, push start it. That's the life of an NGO vehicle. And uh, you have to put in a transmission, an engine that can be easily, that is familiar. A Toyota or a Suzu small turbo diesel engine. Not to, not not too powerful if i had designed the the um uh grenadier i would have put in a three liter suzu engine in it. um it's very frugal incredibly incredibly good on fuel so then your 90 liter tank which is for that engine and that drivetrain just too small as i said in the video um, then it would be usable acceptable not great but usable with an engine with which is you know using two thirds the fuel, if not less, and um, and a manual gearbox, straight manual gearbox. Oh, and the automatic four wheel drive system that's that's questionable. I, I'm not necessarily saying it has to be part time four wheel drive, but anyway, simplify, simplify, simplify. Why would an NGO at the moment take the quartermaster and say I can buy two Isuzu four-wheel drives for the price of one quartermaster and the payload is the same why would you buy a Grenadier why there's no reason to in fact there are a lot of reasons not to apart from the fact that you could buy two Isuzus for one Grenadier there is no reason to buy a Grenadier unless you are giving the cars away and even if you are giving the cars away like the americans did with the ford f-150s you better supply infrastructure to help the ngos manage the fleet because that is a complicated car am i ranting <clears throat> will defender owners wave to ineos grinder no now, did you notice in my video, right at the end, I went and parked next to a Land Rover Defender. Heiner was filming me, and I saw the Defender on the beach, and I thought, get a shot, park next to him. And I looked at the Defender owner. Defender owners, having been one, look out for other Defenders and wave at them, and will stop and talk. And if there's a Defender somewhere, You'll have a whole lot of people around it with a bonnet open and everybody staring into the bonnet. That's the Defender way. It's one of the great parts about owning Defender. He didn't even look up. He was in the passenger, sitting in the passenger seat. He did not even look up. And I actually tried to attract his attention. Didn't look up. I don't think Land Rover owners are going to wave at any of drivers. No, they're not. Uh -uh. <clears throat> I hope Grenadiers like Toyota, Toyota easy, easy to find parts. It's not going to be. It's impossible. And the reason why I say that is that it, it, Toyota has cornered the market in NGOs and cornered them because they've invested a huge amount of money in it. And they've adapted their vehicles. You know, their vehicles, I understand NGO vehicles from Toyota are shipped out of a company called Toyota Gibraltar Holdings. So they're they're built a lot of them are built in portugal and some in japan and these basically are hilux 70 series land cruisers and 300 series and prados and i know of the i actually saw a picture of it 200 land cruisers excuse me the 200 land, uh, land cruiser built for um, I don't know if it was UNESCO or one of the big NGOs and it was operating in a war area had a big red button and the big red button was if you have an engine failure if you have one of the because the, the electronics on all these modern engines run on a CAN bus system which supplies information 
to the uh, about the engine parameters, running parameters, gearbox, and even the new trip carrier is like this. And this is digital. And if you have a meltdown, uh, something seriously go wrong, the engine actually can get to a point where it says, I can't run anymore. And it goes into, we're all familiar with it, limp mode is normally the first. Okay. This red button says, I don't give a shit. I need you to go now. And you press that button and it turns off everything. The engine will run, the gearbox will run, and you can, and they then can get out of trouble. It's the, uh, it's the um, get out of jail free card. When it, trouble gets so, it, it, where the occupants are threatened, and even if it wants to go into limp mode because of something, this cancels the limp mode. And that was, for example, that's never going to be put into a vehicle available to the general public. It was built for those NGOs operating in hazardous environments where it, you just, it just turns off only those things absolutely needed to run the engine remain running and everything else is turned off and the engine will run. Even if it has no, low, no oil pressure, it'll run until it eventually kills it, destroys itself. Because, well, imagine driving those vehicles in a stressful situation where there's gunfire and stuff and suddenly, bing, you've gone into limp mode. I'm now going to go through and um, have a look at some of the, uh, the, the, my, my Patreon comments. Um, about the Grenadier, my wife wants a new car and I will do all I can to convince her to replace her Ford Explorer with a Honda Pilot, but with a Grenadier. Why would you want a Honda Pilot? I think a Grenadier will be a much better vehicle for her and any other during our weekend trips. Okay, this is on a uh, Honda Pilot is on a different planet from Grenadier. It's di it's an utterly different kind of vehicle. Uh, the Grenadier is a it's a proper off road machine. Uh, Honda Pilot is a, is an all wheel drive. You can't go off road with it. It's all wheel drive. I'm not going to get into the difference between four wheel drive and all wheel drive. Let me just say this: all wheel drive and four wheel drive they are not the same thing. They are very very different. And the Ford Explorer, it's a nice car. It's not particularly strongly built. Um, it's just nice to drive and probably good for a weekend trip, but that's about all. Um, Boris has asked my opinion on the electric rear diff, diff, diff lockers in the uh, Grenadier. I don't know too much about them. There's nothing wrong with electric diff lockers, honestly. There's nothing wrong with them. They are slower to engage than hydraulic types or air types. I'm generalizing. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with them. You just need to be a little bit more patient with them and they are fine. They are not necessarily any less reliable. Okay, and also he's asking about those extra buttons on the roof panel. Um, are they troublesome to use for spots? They are absolutely not troublesome for to use the spots and that's why they're there. They are really easy to use for accessories. They are they're pre-wired so definitely not troublesome they are brilliant okay um, <clears throat> since the gas tank is small and the auxiliary tank may not be available on the aftermarket for some time please discuss ways you might consider carrying extra gas well somebody is talking about doing something with the exhaust system and fitting in an extra tank underneath I think that would be the first thing I would investigate to get extra mileage honestly it's the to me, it's that, and as I said before, the footwell and that that uh, small gas tank is a challenge, particularly with the petrol models. And of course, you in the US, you're not getting the pet with diesel, are you? That's a real problem. And my experience in the US has been, uh, we I did a trip in 17, I think it was. We did Death Valley. We had to turn back. And I had a Tundra. Okay, that drank fuel. I had tundra and i had two jerry cans or three jerry cans still wasn't enough so um jose said i read torn trousers and loved it yeah it's a great book uh 
Okay, uh, Jose, you are saying extremely frustrating to, uh, the re to realize that Grenadier seems to have fallen into the usual nonsense. I can understand the high-end first model to push the brand forward. I agree with you. But things like small fuel tank and no apparent easy upgrades and the hump. I don't understand how much effort, time and money is spent to develop a vehicle and they still screw it up. Well, you know, they, they, they have they screwed it up? Every, it, no matter... Two things, okay, in my opinion. No vehicle is perfect, okay? And every vehicle, no matter what they did, it would have some shortcomings. So can you live with the shortcomings? A small gas tank is, a, a, to me, a major oversight and a mission. Did they say, our mission is to build this? Or did they say, how big is the Land Rover fuel tank? Oh, it's 90, I would put in 90. Um, how big is the, and uh, I would do that, do that, do that. Did they do that? I don't know if they did that. Did they actually say, what do we want to, what do we want to build? This thing has got to do what? What has it got to do? Did they write a list? It's got to do the following. Boom, boom, boom. First, it's got to have a range of a thousand miles. That should have been near the top of the mission list for a vehicle like this. Imagine that. How many vehicles has got a, a range of a thousand miles? How many? Imagine if they could have said that. It doesn't even have a range of 400 miles. So it wasn't a priority to them. What was the priority? So I understand from my understanding a little bit about the, the, the four-wheel drive world. If they had built a very basic vehicle, then they're trying to build, they're trying to launch a car brand it's not just making a vehicle they're trying to create a car brand so when you you got to decide where your brand wants to be do you want to be seen as being cheap and cheerful or do you want to be right up there with the best so I would say it was important to them to build a vehicle that was high-end highly respected why do you think they put a BMW engine in it they put a BMW engine in it because A, it was convenient because where they were building the car, and two, in the United States, ooh, BMW, the United States would be a very important part of their market. It's got a BMW engine. Great. So it has a, it's already aligning itself with a very strong European auto brand. So by doing that, they're associated with that brand. BMWs aren't cheap cars, so they want, they're not making a cheap car. They have obviously said, I, uh, we want to build a, a new car brand and we want to be seen as what? Well, our first car is going to be a really good car. And then we can come back a bit because we've established how good we can do things. And then we can build lesser models. So I kind of, I think, I'm, I'm guessing, of course, I don't work for them, but that, that, that's what their motivation was. Build something pretty, really special to start with and then offer lesser models at lower prices and then the more agricultural versions which would probably be a smart thing to do so remember this is mark one grenadier and there will be others too and it's very expensive they did with the bmw engine a similar thing to uh, some of you will remember this car it was called the the um sangyong muso and i had one on test those of you who really know my work well would have seen it in my book. There was a picture; it was black, and it was a it was a double cab, but it, but it was an open back, but a double cab, based on the same body shell as the as the, the uh, station wagon, open back. And <clears throat> I had my G wagon, and I given it to some friends, and we were going to swap. and And I, I did a review on the vehicle for the book. I didn't videotape it; it's not on YouTube. I didn't videotape it, and. Uh, I, my conclusion was that <clears throat> it was biblically awful. It was so, everything about it was bad. Everything. You name it. It was shocking from the quality of the fabrics on the seat to the plastic dashboard to this complete inability to get any traction out of any wheel because of the geometry of the suspension. You lift the front wheels this much and the thing would lean and it would just break traction. And I remember there was this tall, this, this rocky climb. This, and we had a, <clears throat> there were five people in the G-Wagon and five people in the Muso. 
and we couldn't get the moose up. It, it just wouldn't get a quarter, not even a quarter of the way up. The first gnarly bit on a bit of a, it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't go. And the reason I mention that is that it had a Mercedes Benz engine. It had the the five cylinder straight five. Um, it was the same motor that they actually later put in the 290 GD. But in the 290 GD, they had a um, they had a basically a water cooled inter intercooled turbo, and uh, it was by no means overpowered, but it was fine. It was really 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 fine. But in the non turbo charge version, the Muso was it was. If you think the one HZ Toyota engine is underpowered, try this Muso. I eventually went back all the way down the hill, tied a rope on the front back of the G-Wagon and just pulled him all up the hill. <clears throat> we didn't even stop. And the, the driver in the, in the Muso said, eventually I realized that whenever I put my foot down, I just spin my wheel. So eventually I, I just put it in neutral and let you drag me up the hill. So the G-Wagon could drag it up the hill where it couldn't even drive on its own. And so it was that bad. It's not that the G-Wagon was that good. Yes, the G-Wagon is very good. It's that bad. But they managed to sell quite a few of them because they hung the entire brand on the Mercedes-Benz engine. And after a while, people just realized this is a piece of crap. Even, I'm sorry, the, the Mercedes-Benz engine doesn't count for anything. It's an awful engine in that form. And so people associate or oh, Mercedes-Benz engine it must be a good car it must be a high quality car it was a shocking car so that gives you a little bit of insight I the way I see Ineos's approach the um, the idea that they've built a a vehicle as a spiritual successor to Defender they haven't they just they could still I could still. You need to drop the price by 20,000 Australian dollars. Get rid of their seats. Get rid of all the electric clever cleverness. Get rid of it. Just get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Simple, 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 simple. Key I S. Keep it simple. S. Keep it simple, stupid. Jason has asked, I have a fully customized. 22 inch power wagon with king suspension, 37 inch wheels and a go fast camper. But I learned technique and proper sand driving techniques from you over the years. Well, that's very, very nice of you, Jason. <clears throat> I'm going to mention that because outside in the back, I'm about to release a video on my troop carrier. I have the 2.8 auto troop carrier. I'm about to do a re review on it. And um, it's got narrow tires this narrow on tar those tires are terrible I'm gonna go sand dune driving with a guy with 33s big 33s and I promise you I will go everywhere where he goes and I'm saying that now before I've even done it we're planning it in two weeks time and I'll do that for the review I will prove to you it's not the width of the tires that makes the difference it's the diameter on sand so Thank you for that. Thank you for your contribution, Jason. Appreciate it very much. I was once driving. Um, I, I went to a talking about talking about sand driving. I went to a, a guy and um, there was a press event at a place called Clip Book Cop. Stone Antelope Hill is the Afrikaans English translation. And it was about a two hour drive from my home. It was a press event and the I, I met a guy there um, who was doing driving instruction for Goodyear tires and he had the the Goodyear eco challenge which was actually renamed the ego challenge because of the egos involved he was a very very experienced off-roader his name is Gerard very experienced off-roader and he said to me, you taught me something. And I thought, and I said to him, I'm interested. What, what did you learn? Because I knew he was that experienced. He said, your technique for getting out of sand tracks. He said, best technique I've ever used. So you get these sand tracks in Botswana. They were very common parts of Namibia too, but very, very common. Where you have the, the middle mound, or middle monarchy in Afrikaans. The middle monarchy, 
the track, the spur, and then you have high on the on the sides of the track. It's quite high and it's soft sand. So you can literally drive, and I'm not kidding, with your arms folded because the car will just stay in there. And I, I would, you'd drive for hours, and you'd try and stop the car from doing because it would tend to. Okay, so that was a very slight steering to try and stop it from. Because if you take your hands off, it tends to do this. But now you'd have somebody coming in the opposite direction. Oh, crikey. So you slow down, slow down, slow down. Now, if you do this, it goes, and you're bogged. You're stuck. And then you have to, you do rocking, try and get back into the middle of the track. Okay. Well, how do you get around? And I, for, 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 for years, had driven in that thing, and I figured it out. What you drew, do is you drive straight and not too fast, probably at between 15 and 20 kilometers an hour ish, somewhere like that. But the most important thing is not so much the speed, you mustn't go too fast, but you must have a bit of momentum behind the car. You take the steering wheel and you do this. Okay, you turn it that much, or with the Grenadier it'll be that much. But the most important part of it of this is you center it. It doesn't matter what happens. If it comes off the track, you center it. If it doesn't come off the track, you center it. You must center it. It's vital to center it, to reason. But as you do it, you take your foot off the accelerator. Uh, you accelerate a bit and accelerate off, which induces oversteer in a four-wheel drive vehicle as you, you lift off oversteer, basically. Lift off oversteer, turn hard and straighten. What the car now does is it does this. Now the induction, the inducement of the lift off oversteer makes the back twitch. You're telling it which way to twist. So now you're going along the track, but you're facing like this. That's what you want. And as it starts to climb, if you leave your wheels turned, they'll just act as plows. So you straighten them. So you go whoop, whoop. And now the car is sitting at an angle on the sand ridge with its wheels straight. And that is what takes you across over the lump. It's because the wheels are straight. <clears throat> so you turn them, change the direction of the car and go and you drive straight off the track. Once you're off the track, gentle turn because it's normally very soft at the side as well, extremely soft. Keep going, keep the momentum going, straighten the steering wheel and use very small steering wheel turns. Very small, because the moment you do it a little bit more, those of you who sand drives drive understand that. A little bit too much turn on the steering wheel, they act as a plow, the car stops. So you're always, if you want it to accelerate in sand, straighten your, straighten your steering wheel is the first thing to do. So that's what you do. And he told me that he had learnt a lot and he had went out and tried it and he said, that is the best technique I've ever used. So there's a, a bit of sharing for you. And I made a video about four-wheel drive that would have been a a video in 1998, somewhere around there, 1999, somewhere around there, when I, sh when I actually filmed that. I went to Botswana and actually filmed that. And I was driving a white Prado. Some of you in South Africa have, will remember that. Mercedes-Benz was an old engine bought by sang -Yong to be reproduced. Okay, interesting, interesting. But they used the Mercedes-Benz brand as a flag, you know. Um, a wave to everyone you with a 4x4 if you helped me so much and saved me. Thank you. Thank you. It's a huge thank you. Thank you to Andrew and you love your channel. Thank you. Uh, who was that now? Who was that? Um, crashed protocol. All right. Okay. So that's um, that bit of technique. That's a bit of, that's a bit of insight into it. how to not get bogged on heavily angled sand dunes. How to not get bogged on heavily angled sand dunes. Don't stop. You can't stop on the heavily angled sand dune. You can't stop. So what you do, again, it's the same principle. You need power to keep you from stopping and you point the steering wheel straight. And now if you're trying to climb the dune, okay, Sl small steering wheel because the moment you turn even slightly 
you are going to get massive drag and you keep the power you keep your foot you throw open the throttle and you leave it wide open all the way wide open when on a sand dune then if it doesn't want to go and you feel it going oh turn down immediately turn down because as you turn down the wheels are now becoming straight resistance is less you'll accelerate if you don't accelerate, turn down the dune. Make sure it does accelerate. Do whatever you need to do from the steering wheel to make sure it accelerates. If it's to straighten and then accelerates while the vehicle, while the steering wheel is straight, great. Accelerate. Try again. Bit more. If it doesn't do it, straighten again. Get a little bit more speed. Full power. Do not take your foot off the accelerator, especially when you've turned that wheel. I know you want to induce oversteer but remember you're now trying at a at a at an angle where the the lower wheel is creating so much drag the moment you decelerate unless you've got bags of excess power like tons of it you will just lose power and that's the end of it so you have to use full power lots and lots of power to keep the vehicle moving and keep the momentum viewing uh, and if it gets to the point where you realize it's just too steep turn foot flat and then once the vehicle gravity takes over you can ease it back and go down the slope that's why engines with lots and lots of power do better on dunes because you can have more control when it goes sideways those with low power can't maintain the slope. The vehicle just wants to bog in. The back wants to break away and it wants to bog in. But if you can keep the momentum going, the steering wheel, the, the wheels in the front will steer the car and keep it straight. If you lose power, the back breaks. You can't let the back break. If you let the back break, bleh, you're stuck. You can't let that back break. Keep it straight, keep it straight with full power. And if it doesn't want to stay straight and you're using all the power you've got, well then it's, there's nothing you can do. Turn down the slope or bog. I hope that helps. <laughs> so, Vega Venturing, we are loving our Grenadier. I have appreciated entry and insight. Okay, I, I, I was given a lot of flack by people who, you know, said, um, one of them said uh, the, the, the lump in the thing is a non-issue and that I was scratching an itch that I want did I keep did I keep it somewhere here? It it was a very annoying comment. What itch? I got into the Grenadier thinking, this is fantastic, a new, a brand new four-wheel drive that I can I know about the, the I hope it isn't a problem. The lump. And I was honest. For me, it was a problem. For you, it might not be a problem. For me, it was. Don't dispute it, it's a fact. I'm not speaking for you. Don't speak for me. <clears throat> I confess I thought you were going, giving the Ineos a big tick, not understanding range and the hump. Love your show. Um, I, I, was, I, I have to be honest and I'm sharing my experiences and I, it's only my opinion. Honesty, it's only my opinion. It's not gospel. And you, it's important that you understand, most of you do understand that. It's, you know, um, what do you think about Bill Burke and other commentary participants thinking of the Grenadier and the modern vaping company's off-road event? I haven't seen anything about that. Um, I think the Grenadier, my, my, I, I see the Grenadier doing not very well in England, uh, reasonably well in Asia, uh, in, in Australia. Uh, sorry, let me start that again reasonably well in Europe, not particularly well in the UK, not well at all in Australia, and really quite well in the US. That's my prediction. It's just a prediction. It's based on what I see. And the reason why I don't think it'll do well in Australia is because it doesn't have the range and it's got that lump. So. Uh, the, I know of enough people who have said, yeah, the lump is, is not, you know, and here are people that were genuinely interested. And they're saying that lump is, is a problem. It is a problem. Yes. 
<clears throat> All right, Albo, it's one in the morning. You must be in the UK. You in the UK? One in the morning? Must be in the UK. Um, at that price, scratch all the itches you have. Afternoon, Andrew. I started watching your videos a few years ago and have since bought a Troopy and a Headspace conversion. Spent a week in it currently. Loved how easy it was to set up. So um, I'm putting a Headspace on my latest Troop Carrier. Um, it's a... Oh, I'm not going to go into it now. Um, uh, so please give your opinion. This is again Boris, one of my Patreons, uh, on the... Grenadier's BMW straight six versus the Toyota V8. Um, I don't think I sh could compare the two. I'm not sure if I can. Uh, the Toyota V8 is a proven engine and, and, and in, in four wheel drive vehicles. And the BMW is not a proven engine in four wheel drive vehicles. Uh, performance wise. I don't think there's a big difference, actually. And, and part of my, my in, um, Troopy review, I do quite a bit of comparisons between my V8. Um, I'm still feeling a little bit of sell, seller's remorse, but it's not seller's remorse is, oh, I wish I hadn't sold it. It's not that kind of seller, seller's remorse, is that it was so good. And I, I do, I am enjoying my 2.8 a lot, but the reasons why I'm enjoying it, you'll have to wait for the review of that one thing that I've, I've noticed a, a lot of people will will um, comment on my comment on the uh, on the Ineos and and there very very few will say uh, I agree people that have bought them I agree with you that lump it's a real problem in fact nobody not a single person has said I agree with you who owns a Grenadier because it's the same with any vehicle I don't go around telling anybody, to, well, I might do because I'm a broadcaster, but going on and on about the weaknesses of the troop carrier. I've done a bit in this latest video, actually, because there are some things that annoy me about it. But once you've invested in a car, why would you shout from the rooftops about something about it you find unbearable? You wouldn't. You'd just shut up about it. You'd do one of two things. You'd learn to live with it or you'd get rid of it if it's that serious. And nobody has come back and said, I've got a, you know, and the lump in the floor is a real pain in the backside. Those who have said that have experienced it for themselves and said, yeah, it's a deal breaker for me. I really, I'm not convinced that I could get used to it. And that was where I came from. I don't think I could get used to it. And that is why I'm, I would not consider, but I'll give you, I'll be honest about it. And it's a very, it's a very dangerous thing to be honest on the internet, on YouTube is the lump on the left-hand drive version it is but it's on the right when i got into the ineos and i started driving it because remember i ordered my ineos when everybody else did and i cancelled my order and at about the same time as cancelling my order ordered my new troop carrier 2.8 similar time there wasn't too many months between the two driving in the, in the ineos i my first I, did i do the right thing Man, I like this thing. And I said so in my video, and I was genuine. I like it. I liked it so, so much. And I actually became a bit ticked off with Ineos. Why didn't you give me one of these to review earlier? On Why? Because if you had, I might have bought one. Honest, I'm being absolutely honest. I remember driving it up. I'd driven it around town and we were driving it on the dunes and it was doing so well and I was just getting to grips with this car and I, and, and thought, well, what, would I, what would I do with it? Get rid of those stupid 17-inch rims to start with. That's the first thing I thought of and sort out the electrical. And that's why I said to Heiner and I said, come and have a look here. I, what would I do here? And I, and I asked him what he would do. And that was why I did that. And I, and I, was, I, was, I was genuinely annoyed why didn't you give me one of these early test vehicles like you said you were going to at the end of it kind of worked out well because honestly i wouldn't have bought one because of the lump and i said while i'm driving 
back and remember the scene where we'd been through that very very gnarly thing and um, it had performed very very well it felt it feels good in in grenadier there's something about it that just feels it feels competent which is great so and i remember thinking if i if i was in the market for a luxury four-wheel drive because remember the trippy is not a luxury four-wheel drive so you purely utilitarian it's actually what the grenadier should have been but would i buy this or a 300 land cruiser i don't like the look of the 300 land cruiser it is fabulous to drive it is exceptionally good really it's a very very good car i'd buy a grenadier and i said the reason for that is because it's just plain more interesting <clears throat> just plain more interesting i could do stuff with it i could experiment i i would do a review of the 300 land cruiser because remember i do this for a living i do a review of the 300 and I put in a drawer system and a fridge and some clever um, electrical systems and it would be very cool and I would finish it in three videos, maybe four. Grenadier, because it's, so, it's an interesting and challenging vehicle, it would be more than just four videos. It would be a lot more and I'd be investigating things like roof conversions and da 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 da. So that I would do. But I wouldn't be sitting thinking, gee, I can't wait to take it for a drive because which to me is that is the it's why it's why those of you who know the channel i didn't keep my dream tourer i i didn't look forward to getting it and just taking it for a run to me that is the it is what makes four-wheel drive special that you would go and i'm going to go and get the newspapers and i'm taking the grenadier why because it's there and i've got the keys I, do I need another reason? I do that occasionally with my trippy. Oh, I take the trippy. Why? Mm. Mm. Come on, drive it. I I don't think that'll happen to the Grenadier because of the lamp. So in the end, at the end of the review, somebody's saying, "What is under the under the lamps? Part of the exhaust system." And they couldn't get rid of it. And an exhaust system is attached to the engine. When the engine starts, it they move. And they vibrate a lot separately from the body. They're on rub. Everything's on rubber mounts, so that there's, you know, um, so they can flex. And so they need that space for the engine to move. And there's an exhaust thing underneath it, and uh, that's what it is. Andrew, when the 2.8 came out in the Hilux, Mr. Baccaroni from Queensland, how are you, Buck? Buck Rogers. Uh, YouTuber. Nobody ever said that it had the power of the V8. Now it has been put into the 70 series. All of a sudden, it's as powerful as the V8. Thoughts? Okay. Well, th that's good. Th it's a. You, you, you <laughs> I've watched some of the reviews. I and I will. And this is really an Ineos Grenadier discussion. But I'll. I'll. Okay. The 2.8. It goes well. It has. Uh, an, an annoying uh, turbo lag and gearbox delay which every now and again you <clears throat> nothing happens and then it goes which I find annoying and uh, and if anybody is now saying eh, it's better than the V8 better than the V8 well I am not driven it off-road yet so I can't really tell but my gut is this if you drive a V8 manual on sand dunes and you drive the 2.8 auto on sand dunes and you are not a particularly skilled driver you will the 2.8 will perform far far better because those of you who've done sand driving you up there and you start losing a little bit of power and then you wait with a manual for a a rough part of the track a corrugation or a woof or something halfway up the track where actually you, you time your gear back and you back in a second for example you got to be skilled you got to know when to do it otherwise the thing stops you reverse back down what do you do in automatic just change down you don't even have to wait they're far, far easier to drive off-road than a manual, um, particularly in sand, I think. So, um, yeah.
that's that's how I feel about it. I, I, I mean, I and the V8 is a fantastic off-road car. It's fantastic, particularly mine had a bit of a tweak, and so well, I could drive it off-road really, really slowly. Have you tried those of you with V8s? I don't know if the 2.8 has it. A low anti-stall crawl. Has the has the 2.8 got a crawl gear? The, the V8 crawl gear is a phenomenal thing. Not very many people who drive V8s even know about it. Has the 2.8 got it? Don't know. About to find out. So we'll we'll, we'll, we'll skip that. Love the Afrikaans in today's show. Joburg, Dion. How's it, Dion? It's like I'm from Joburg. Cool. Joburg, jo Joey's Johannesburg. Uh, not my favorite city, Fred. Dion. Yeah, really not my favorite city. Actually, one of my least favorite cities. Anyway. Um, but hello. Um, West Melbourne. Late arrival here from West Melbourne. G'day, John. Um, I sound like the lump solution is simple. Change the wheelbase. Mm, I think you and I have different definitions of the word simple. Um, right. Let me see if there's any uh, anybody else. How long have we been online? I hope you're enjoying the show. Tell me if you're enjoying the show. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you're enjoying the show. Um, sharing a little bit of my experiences here. I'm going to just uh, refresh that page. Any more Patreon questions? Any thoughts on the new IMV uh, Hilux? No, I, I don't know enough about it for the new Toyota IMV. Uh, I don't know the, enough about it to be able to... Um, um, your grenadier, Jose said, your grenadier view is excellent. I had held some hope for a reasonably priced successor to Land Rover Defender. Yeah, like us all, I see that my hopes have, did not come to fruition. Maybe they will. Maybe they will. Looking to the new troopy basic truck. Uh, IMV Hilux Champ, uh, I believe it's called. Yeah, I don't know too much about it, actually. Time that I did some research on that. All right. Uh, let's see what else. Um, that's about it's about all I have from my Patreons at this time. All right. Um, just going through some um, comments here. Um, Grenadier versus V the uh, seventy six and the seventy six looks like a winner. Okay, so we compare the seventy six to a, a Grenadier. All right, seventy six is smaller, inside space width a lot smaller back seat room a lot smaller packing space similar okay Land Cruiser has solid axles on leaf springs at the back coil springs at the front I think the axle travel is very similar even though Grenadier has coil springs its axle travel is not particularly good all right and in fact you could easily um, increase it with uh, the leaf springs actually funnily enough with a with a leaf spring it's actually easier to actually increase that vertical axle wheel travel let's put it this way you have to do less you, you can't with a coil yes you can get it more yes I understand that you have to ch but you have to change more to get the coil on the solid axles to reach down and have more vertical wheel travel all you really need to do with a rear and then the, but there are limits. You, you, generally speaking, a coil will always reach further than a leaf as a general rule. But just by extending the length of those rear spring shackles, you can make a leaf spring actually articulate a lot more. Just, just doing that. Just that. And then when you want a little bit more, then you would might want to look at changing, putting extenders on the... Um, on the stabilizer bar and then it starts getting complicated but you can do it you can do it with a coil spring as well but standard grenadier coil uh actual travel is very similar to g-wagon it's not particularly good it's not nearly as good as the old defender but here's the thing i remember driving the old defender i had my g-wagon it was my mate's farm in stony ridge in natal and there was a there was an obstacle some of these obstacles were really tricky very very technical so i loved going there and john was an outstanding driver and instructor and i witnessed the 
the the defender obviously old defender when i say defender assume that i'm talking pre-15 and it was leaning and the track was like this and it was lumpy but it was at a curve and at a rather uncomfortable angle and there was a bit of a drop rather uncomfortable angle so you did it very slowly very carefully and the weight of the defender will pull the inside wheels off the ground so before you know it center locker locked the back wheel would spin out g-wagon on exactly the same slope exactly the same with no lockers apart from mine uh, didn't have permanent full-time four-wheel drive it had part-time four-wheel drive in four-wheel drive I wouldn't spin out at all no spinning at all I would lean less because I had less actual travel which meant the vehicle sat flatter and it had no difficulty at all but then up the climbs where you needed a lot of reach the defender was better than most vehicles because it had the reach standard but on that slope it was worse than most vehicles even some of the pickups were better than defender because it would pull its wheels off but then it would hit a lump and it would just spin inside wheels so that was an interesting thing again comparing it to the 76 the the grenadier is far more comfortable than a 76 everything about it is more comfortable than the 76 it's got much better seats the driving position is similar similar driving position the 76 is a little higher than the a little bit higher than the grenadier um in terms of its ability for accessories obviously the 76 can be far better because of all of the stuff that's already available far far better in terms of pure performance the the 76 is going to be better because the new one if you buy a 2.8 not the v8 it'll be similar performance it'll have much lower fuel consumption quite i think considerably lower it's got a 130 liter fuel tank that alone 130 liter fuel tank and the payload very similar so if i look at the payload of grenadier and i scroll down some notes the gvm is 3550 Let's compare it with the Troopy. Troopy GVM, the new one, 3510. So 40 kilos difference. So let's say it's the same. Okay, curb weight of Grenadier, 2618, which leaves a payload of 932 kilograms. It's not bad. It's not great, but it's not bad. It's workable. As I said in my very early reviews when I looked at these specs, we can work with that. Okay. But um, the curb weight of troop carrier is 2290, and I have a payload of 1,220 kilos. That's a lot more. It's a lot more. So, I mean, so um, 76. I don't have the specs for the 76, but I wouldn't be surprised if it is exactly the same as troop carrier. So it can carry a lot more weight. And you don't need to put fuel tanks on the outside of it because it's got a 130 litre standard tank. It's not nearly as nice to drive. Not nearly. Really. It's not. And it's a fair bit cheaper, but not a lot cheaper, but it is a bit cheaper. All right. Let's have a look at a few other questions here. A proper modern dormobile. Okay. Uh, um, <clears throat> right how do you read sand after rain <laughs> uh, I've gone and skipped this silly thing how do you read sand after rain uh, you can feel it as you're driving on it you, it's sand is quite difficult to, to, to read just by looking at it anyway firm sand when it's rain of course actually sticks the the, the, the sand particles together makes it firmer reading it after rain yeah you once you've driven on it you can you can feel it pretty pretty straight straight away um, uh, great show tonight Andrew I get an education every time I watch you uh, thank you off-road um, if you want you know you do know about my overland workshop don't you overland workshop I've gathered some of the world's best known and um, <clears throat> most experienced uh, overland 
explorator, explore, ex, explore, what's the word? The guys who are really in the know and we teach courses about overlanding and off-roading. Okay, it's myself, Paul Marsh, we're the two main guys. And there are a few other people too. Um, <clears throat> Putting aside the problems, would you be able to build a grenadier interior similar to a troopie? N no. No, you can't. A troopie is a van. And what is what makes the troopie unique? It's a van, which is a big hollow space. The grenadier is full of seats. You'd have to take out the seats, take out those electrics, but this hasn't got a high roof. Troopie's got a high roof. My Africa troopie, I'm not putting a roof conversion in it, and I'm actually... I've actually put the interior we're building into the troop carrier, which is happening this month in South Africa, is no roof conversion. But the fact that I've got a van makes a massive difference. Granity is not a van. So, no. You would, you would do something else, and you cannot live in and in stroke out of a, of a grenadier, no matter what you did with it. You have to get some height to be able to do something with it. Okay. Worst world travel is the new Defender. So it's a good point you make there, but they make up with it with some very clever electronics. And it's when those electronics fail that is the problem. But um, what would you do to do a mild tune of the 2.8? Andre, I don't know, and I will find out. It's one of the reasons why I bought a 2.8. I will find out. Will I do a mild tune? What is available? What is proven? All those questions. I, 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 I've never taken a vehicle and immediately made massive, massive changes, particularly to the engine. I will change things that I know, suspension, get the ride right, etc. But not the engine. That will come later. Uh, <clears throat> Apparently the relay auxiliary switch panel can short circuit and catch fire on the Grenadier. What you're basically saying, Crash Protocol, is that they haven't prop, prop put in proper fuses. Is that what you're saying? Because anything can catch fire, but if you put in proper fuses. So you're saying it can catch fire. Well, is that user-induced or is that a manufacturer-induced problem? If it's user-induced, oh, they put in the wrong type of fuse for the cabling because they don't know what they're doing. And the car's caught fire because they've put the wrong fuse in. I doubt if Ineos put the wrong fuses in. No, nah, come on. That, that, no, nah, don't believe it. Don't believe it. <clears throat> Not impossible, but I don't believe it. Um, I'm confused about the hump, Bruce. The hump basically is a big lump in the driver's footwell on the left, and it means that when driving, your le your your left knee is here and your right knee is there, and there is nothing you can do about it apart from taking your foot, curling it sideways and sticking it this way to get your knee level with the others. So the only way you can sit straight in an Ineos's driver's seat is to curl your left foot behind your right foot and lie it flat sideways. If you straight, you cannot straighten your right, your left leg in an Ineos Grenadier. You cannot. And I'm six, I'm five foot 11. You cannot even your, your knee is constantly bent. I got in my troopie to make a comparison. I can stretch my, my, my left leg all the way. I can have a good old stretch. You cannot in an Ineos Grenadier. There's a flipping great big thing in the way. There you go. And it's got an exhaust, part of the exhaust pipe underneath it. And family vote, thank you very much for your contribution. I really enjoyed it. I'm glad you're enjoying the show. Um, Abel's ask, what do you reckon the aftermarket company's products enthusiasm will be for the Ineos? That's up to Ineos sales. So uh, at the moment it's slow, but it's there. So it's kind of a chicken and egg situation. Are you selling lots of cars and then the demand for accessories goes up and therefore it'll just roll, it'll, be, it'll create itself. The industry will create itself. And that is what everybody is hoping for the Grenadier. Um, I was browsing just yesterday the, the Ineos's uh, price list. And they have tried to foresee this by creating a lot of their own accessories. But I'm afraid it's not enough. It's not enough. Uh, it's a good start. 
but it's not enough. Um, all right, let's have a scroll down here. Um, thank you, Omnipotus. <laughs> Appreciate your contribution very much. Um, I've owned Broncos all my life. I actually wanted to drive a new Bronco when I was in the States, but didn't get the opportunity to. Couldn't make it happen. I think that new Bronco is not, not the baby, not the Bronco sport. The proper Bronco. Oh, it's a good looking thing. Um, new Prado 2, uh, 250 will kill the market for the 70 series wagon. No, it won't, Terry. It will not. Two different types of car. Mm, completely different kinds of car. The Prado is a medium duty. It's not a heavy duty car, but it's not a light duty car. It's far stronger than things like the D-Max and the Ever, uh, Explorer, Ford Explorer, and the, and the, you know, these. it's far stronger than those. But it's not of the strength of, uh, of Land Cruiser 70. So Land Cruiser 70 is about the strongest you can get out there. That's why it's so popular with the NGOs, and that's why the mines like it, because they last longer, because they can take a beating over a long period of time. And that is why... To, that is why that um, the, 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 they're popular with those organizations and we're popular with us as overlanders because we like the fact that these things can take a beating. You can still break them. Prado will be cheaper than a 76 wagon and they will sell more of them. Different type of buyer. A Prado buyer wants to put a draw system in maybe, maybe a rooftop tent and use it as a weekend. And those of you adventurous will build them into overlanders and go overlanding travel and maybe pull a, and they're very, very good tow vehicles. They're, they're great, good cars, really good cars. But the 70 series is a different type of car and a different kind of market. So don't agree with you there, I'm afraid. Uh, <clears throat> Jan Hendrik, lots of from South Africa. Uh, Thanks to, for this live, fun and insightful as always. Would love to know if you think Ironman Springs Nitro Gas Turbo is a good upgrade for an Isuzu Frontier Rodeo or OME. So um, I've got to be very, very careful with these this this because I I got to be very careful with this because um, define the word upgrade. Okay. Define the word upgrade. In my opinion, I'm going to say that again. It's just my opinion, and it's just my opinion. It won't be an upgrade. It will be a. Let's put it this way if you want more payload, it'll be an upgrade. And that's where it ends. I have never ridden an Ironman suspension that I thought, hmm, pretty good. Not one. I have written, I've driven several that I've thought, oh my God, I cannot believe how bad this is. Okay. This is my experience. Take it for what it's worth. Okay. I'm not saying anything. I'm just sharing my experience. I can't. Yeah. Okay. I'll go stop there. Right. <clears throat> Honestly, there are so many better products. Oh. <clears throat> so many better products. <laughs> uh, not enough is said of the benefits of being able to walk around the exterior of the vehicle without touching the ground, especially when stuck in the muck. Not enough is said of the benefits of being able to walk around the exterior of a vehicle without touching the ground, especially when stuck in the muck. I have no idea what you're talking about, Slade. Maybe you want to clarify it. I, when I get out of my car, I'm standing on the ground. <clears throat> um, okay, did not know about the workshop. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's a very important part of, uh, of what I do. And, and uh, Overland Workshop is, is amazing. The, the information you can get there is just it's extraordinary. I, it, when, it, when I do new courses every year. I put an, an extra two to three courses every year, new courses. 
And uh, there's no place. I don't believe I'm obviously biased because I, I built it with Paul Marsh and it, there's nothing like it on the planet. And we're not sponsored by anybody. We don't go. It's not about products. It's about mission. Not about products. It's about mission. Your mission. <clears throat> products come later. We don't. We're not sponsored and backed by any product manufacturers. In how about the low-hanging radiator, especially in mud and rocks? Okay, so that a low heading, um, Jaco. I I agree with you that that low-hanging radiator and and on the for example on the canning stock, that would have been a serious liability because we had massive problems with grass, as you probably saw if you watched the Canning Stock series. And I'm going to be releasing that whole series again on YouTube for free downloads. And that's going to come pretty, actually pretty soon. I've re-edited all 13 episodes and I've re-edited it into five, five episodes. Tightened it up. It's very much a TV show now. Edited for television. I'll be releasing that probably late this month, early next month. But that was a... Uh, that was an uh, and if you want to buy it now you can get it from my video on demand just go on to forexoverland.com you'll find it on my tv section we would have struggled it's low down and the protection that any us has put there is insufficient it's not sufficient so uh it is a problem too it is definitely a problem okay how does the grenadier compare with the good old gu nissan patrol you can't compare the two it's, it would be like me saying, how does it compare with the uh, 1975 Range Rover? It's much better. Much better at what? Well, it's, it's um, the, old, the old patrols are very, very strong vehicles. And some had some really good engines. Others didn't have some, had some very mediocre engines. Uh, but generally speaking, very robust, tough, simple machines very effective machines and they were never particularly expensive so that's why i like them so much the, in a way the grand should have been more nissan patrol like not not talking about the new one I'm not talking i'm talking about that i'm talking about the older ones to use and things uh snowy calgary in Can canada i believe your snow has been very late coming in canada okay what makes overlanding different from off-roading that's a brilliant question. Okay. Oh, I just touched my mouse and the thing shoots out from underneath me. Oh, I've gone and I've gone and lost it. Okay, I'm I'm gonna. Um, uh, okay, I'll answer. I don't know where it's gone. It's just difference. Off uh, off road is. Let's go off road. What does that mean? Well, we're going to go somewhere and we're going to drive and see how good our cars are going to be off this train. We're going to say, OK, well, let's go over there and we're going to drive up there. And maybe it's a bit technical and you can compare vehicles and have a good laugh and learn about your vehicles and and drive off road. Over landing is saying. Let's go there and then there and then there and then there and we can camp a place here we can camp there and maybe we spend two nights to get to the lake there how does that feel yeah good so we know that some of it's going to be off-road probably most of it's going to be off asphalt but it's it's the enjoyment of wilderness travel Come what may, and if this off-roading is involved, great. If there's no off-roading involved, who cares, honestly? So the primary objective of off-road driving is to drive off-road. The primary objective of overlanding is to find yourself in a beautiful remote spot. And if it's difficult to get there, great. We have the vehicles to cope with that, and we can get there. That, to me, is the principal difference between <clears throat> the difference. Okay, Mark, the leg position description is nonsense. I'm the same height and both my legs sit pretty even. Well, there is a Grenadier driver, okay, who is telling me that I'm talking crap about the lump on the left. Mark, I'm very pleased that it's not worrying you in the slightest. Full, fantastic very pleased for you because remember I said for me I'm not talking nonsense 
I'm telling you what happened to me. It's not nonsense. It happened to me. You don't have to believe me, but I'm, it's not nonsense. The lump is there, and I know many people, several, well, I know two, and I know one very close friend of mine actually drove it and said, forget it. He said it to me. So it's not nonsense. There are people that it's a problem for. The fact that it's not a problem for you is double thumbs up from me. Fantastic. I'm glad. <clears throat> Both my legs pretty even. You mean they're not even? Your both legs are pretty even. Your legs are not even. <clears throat> Fine. They're not even. That's what I said. They're not even. Define the word pretty. Pretty even? What's that? Pretty even? Is that pretty even? Your definition of pretty is your definition of pretty. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's not necessarily what other people's definition of pretty, uh, pretty even. If you found it not an issue and you're comfortable with it, fantastic. I found it a major problem. And it, as I said, would it would stop me buying the car. <clears throat> um, I thought the new Prada has the same frame as the 300. Don't think it has a smaller car. I might be wrong. Um, right. Thank you for answering my O-lane and questions. OK versus off-road. I'll be taking a new um, uh, Corradetti. Thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, I'll be taking a new 23 Tundra off-roading soon. Uh, that Tundra is another challenging car, that new Tundra. I think it's very ugly. I always liked the Tundra. The new one I thought was pretty ugly. When I saw it in the States when I was there in May, there was a press thing with Toyota and the new Tundra at the hotel I was staying at in Flagstaff, Arizona. So I'm sure the Bill Bar because it really was that just the front end couldn't needed needed a bit of work to get it to look because a tundra is a damn good vehicle you can now buy tundras in in um, australia there's a company there and you can buy them through toyota dealerships i don't know if you can do it now but very very soon the tundra is available in australia <clears throat> how would you fit the interior of a grenadier to make it practical and usable for overland to live out of for an extended period okay to live out of so you can't live in it because it's not high enough. So you would want to, you, you use the basic rules of building an overland vehicle. Write down your mission. All right, this comes directly from Overland Workshop. Write down your mission and write your mission in such a way as you have two columns. And the two columns are least flexible, most flexible. So for example, if you are, uh, you've got, you need four people, you're carrying four people in the car, then the least flexible thing is going to be four seats. Oh, one thing about the Grenadier, it's a four-seater, it's not a five-seater, hey? It's not a five-seater, folks, it's a four-seater. I didn't put that in my review and I meant to. <clears throat> it's got a bloody great big lump right in the middle of the floor pan in the middle seat. It is unsuitable for four, five adults. Right, so mission. What's your mission? Then write flexible, non -flex uh, least flexible, most flexible, and then start writing them down. As you create these two lists, you will then understand what your mission is. And if your mission is, I want to go and take it to a, s a certain place that requires a distance. So your mission is, let's take one thing. We'll just take one thing. All of the elements of your mission will go along these lines. My mission is I want to go to a particular place and spend a week there trout fishing. All right. Uh, where am I going to put my fuel? Does it have enough fuel to get there safely and a comfortable return? If not, OK, you need to make a plan with fuel. Can I take my, uh, I need my fishing tackle. Where's my fishing tackle? Do I need my fishing tackle to be easily accessible or will I only need it when I get there? Am I going fishing, 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 and ultimately fishing? Or am I doing a beautiful trip and then fishing? So, mission. 
It will determine if you need your fishing gear to be easily accessible from inside, from outside the vehicle. If you're using it every single day, you need it reasonably easy to access. If you only need it once in the whole trip, then it doesn't matter. Do that with everything that you put in your truck. Everything, no matter what. And you use it by these flexible, least flexible lists. And you will end up with a vehicle that you put in a drawer system. Do you need solar power? I can't tell you if you need solar power. How long are you going to be there for? Do you have power? Do you have access to power? Are you going to run your, you need to, what are you running on your electrical system? How much battery do I need? Well, what are you running on your electrical system? How are you cooking your food? How are you storing your food? How much water are you carrying? Can you purify water? You're going fishing. Maybe the water is actually quite good enough, maybe not to drink, but to certainly shower with. So you need a grey water system. So you have two tanks, one carrying drinking water and one that you can replenish, refill from the stream because it's actually perfectly good enough to shower with. Mission first. So you build any vehicle in exactly the same way, and that's what you do. And the Overland Workshop, again, will, will answer things like water tanks and fuel tanks and carrying loads on the roof and accessibility and electrical systems. You want to do your own electrical installation? There's a whole course about doing DC electrical installations, talking about fuses, size of fuses, and it's Heiner Plyman did that course and it is brilliant and it is and he's dumbed it down so somebody who knows nothing about it will be able to do it with no experience and those with a lot of experience will be able to say yeah I need a little bit more information about that 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 and that because I kind of understand the basics that's what the Overland Workshop is all about so that was what I, I would suggest to you um, without actually having a vehicle myself and actually building it myself. But remember, what I build in my vehicle is not necessarily going to be the same as the, what you build in your vehicle because our missions are not the same. Is South African beer as good as Australian beer? Craig? It's not even close. I'm sorry, mate. It's not... The only beer I will drink in Southern Africa is Winter Klager. There are microbreweries all over Australia. One of my favourites is a thing called Little Creatures. A little, cre cre little Creatures Pale Ale. Made in Western Australia. Oh, it's good. So, uh, there's some ordinary beers here and there's some great beers here. South Africa, there are a few brands to choose from and South African breweries beers are I I I don't want to call them piss because by calling them piss I'm making them sound better than they really are honestly no no they're not but winter lager is a damn good beer <laughs> I will say that Winter Lager is a good beer. I go to South Africa, Winter Lager in my fridge. Because I know. And if I'm battling here to find a beer, I'll put in a, I'll put in a, a, um, a Peroni. It's Italian. It's a good beer. Nothing special, but it's a good beer. I know what I'm getting. Winter Lager is better than Peroni. I, I actually look forward to my Winter Lager. So I'm, I'm not saying South Africa doesn't make good, good beers. It makes one particularly good beer. And I'm sure there are others that I that are. So I don't want to <laughs> disparage South, uh, South African beer completely. But I will disparage South African breweries beer. Uh, likes the rear lights on the Grenadier. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> so Craig, I'm sure you'll be cross with me now. Um, <clears throat> how watertight was the Ineos? Don't know if you get a chance to drive it in through. Oh, no, no. No, I remember, you know, the Ineos I drove was a lone vehicle. I wasn't about to drive it in deep water. I actually said to him, I am not driving it through. Even on the beach, I said to him, I will not be driving it through even wet sand. I'm going to, you know. Uh, so, no, not with somebody else's vehicle. How how good is it going? I think it'll actually seal quite well, actually. The G-Wagon is supposed to seal. And those of you who have seen my G-Wagon waiting videos realize that it doesn't seal. It's supposed to seal. It doesn't seal. Fills up with water real quick. Um, <clears throat> pull out drawers. 
uh, uh, for a win to sleep on and still access your crap plus it's a nice bench kitchen there are so many things you can do with a with a, a station wagon and you have reasonable room in the in the grenadier it's not lots and lots but it's certainly no more than it's less than my original defender which was really quite a roomy vehicle but i never slept inside my i did a, i did a short solo trip on my own and i slept in the back of my defender but gun and i didn't sleep in my defender we, we had a tent now you will know that how are we doing oh okay wow almost two hours from the retro films that i'm releasing now gwen and i traveled with my defender v8 the one that was released uh this uh this week um, and uh, go and have a look at it because it proves that with very basic equipment you can have an amazing time and it was the two of us I was 30 uh, Gwen was 27 we had met a year or so before and to no, a little more three years before were we married on that trip no we weren't married on that trip we weren't ma we were we were about to get married I think we were about to get married and um, we we even editing it i was thinking to myself we were so comfortable because we didn't have any shit around us it was simple it was just we didn't have to we didn't have stuff that was and there's a certain freedom in that but i like my comfort so i was honest about it in the video i do like my comfort i also like building the vehicles i like the experience of of building vehicles then i didn't have the money not only did i not have lots and oodle little money just to throw at a car like i i can now because i get all these contributors as well as it's a business then i was like anybody just with my four-wheel drive and just stuck stuff in the back and and lived out of it and there was so little in the store you know you go into a four-wheel drive store now and it's like a candy shop there's all these different things less so for me now because I know the industry so well and I know what is available but for me then it would be like a candy store although a minimally stocked candy store because there wasn't actually that much to buy I had Bilstein shocks on my Land Rover. I changed them after the first trip I did. I bought it brand new in 1989. It was a v Rover V8. Had the Stromberg carburetors, a 3.5. Had Did it have the LT95 gearbox? I can't... No, it didn't. It had the later gearbox that actually had a problem with the gearbox. It was a Spanish-built gearbox that actually had problems with it. Um, it was a wonderful wonderful truck very very basic far more comfortable than the uh, Range Rover classic that it actually actually replaced I had them I owned them both for a short period it was far more comfortable far quieter and had an aircon it did have an aircon I did like the aircon definitely like the aircon but it I didn't change the tires or the wheels I changed the shocks to Bilstein and had it had those Bilsteins on since to the point I sold it and I sold it eight and a half years later and at a hundred and 27,000 kilometers on it I love my old defender it was such a practical thing but we never put a roof rack on it we it, we were never particularly heavy it was light it performed so well it um, back castle lager is terrible okay castle lager is absolutely how can you I, I'm back you and I need to have words. He's telling me that Castle Lager is okay, isn't bad. Castle Lager is terrible, Buck. Come on. And those of you in South Africa, Buck, he's as bad an Australian as you can get, and he's telling you your beer's okay. Okay. Craig, thank you, Craig. Have a beer of your choice from Can from Can from from a Canadian. All right. <clears throat> yeah, Buck, shut up. Do you like Vo Do Vaudevors? Uh, and Buck is asking me, do I like Vaudevors? I Yes, I do. A good Boris is very, very nice. A good Boris is not unlike, uh, for those of you in South Africa, again, in Australia, we have uh, Bunnings, which is the, the um, huge and marvelous, <laughs> can't live without them, chain of hardware stores it's, you can get everything at Bunnings everybody loves Bunnings and outside on a Saturday morning there was a, there's already a, a charity that do local charities and they sell a 
Australian version of the Burries. Pretty good with onions and Cokes and everything, and it's cheap. And often, if I'm going on Saturday, I always buy myself a, uh, a Burry roll from Bunnings. Burravos is farmer sausage for those of you in other parts of the world. It's a South African sausage. It can be very oily and very greasy, but a good one is fabulous. Fantastic on a white roll with onion, onion rings and a beer. We've lived on them on my boating trips. Now, um, I'm doing a, I'm releasing a video. I did a boat trip in, uh, actually it was last year. I did a boat trip with my mate, uh, Jeremy, on uh, Lake Powell. And I talk about some of my boating adventures. And it's a long time coming, this video. I haven't released it, but I will be releasing it this week, this month. And uh, I talk about some of our trips we did in my boating trips when I was 17, 18, 19 years old. We had, we ate, we lived on buries, buri rolls. We lived on the stuff. Buri, buravos is translated, if I hadn't mentioned it, farmer's sausage. Very spicy meat sausage, very South African. And I, n there are not a lot of foods, I would say, that South African kind of, you know, can be really proud of. Buris is one of them. There are a few, and, and, and buris is definitely one of them. We still eat things like babuti, which is a South African dish and um, a few others but that worries we still eat worries now and there are a lot of south african shops in perth because there's so many south africans in perth if you want to hear afrikaans go to bunnings on a saturday morning and you'll hear you know bloke and his wife in the other aisle talking about their stoop in afrikaans at bunnings so that yeah you know, so a lot of south africans in western australia particularly the northern part of perth where i live so i didn't come here because of south africans living here I came to Jindalup because my brother was living here, or had lived here, and my uh, brother-in-law lives in Jindalup. That's why we came here, because it was we it was a soft landing. We had people that we know or knew all the stuff, and that's why we dropped here. Not not because we don't hang out with the South African crowds. We don't feel the need to, but there are a lot of South Africans here. Um, Shane says, can't remember the beer brands we had available to us in Namibia in 89, too long ago. I don't, I don't drink beer. We had a boozer with various compounds we had then. Wintock Lager has been around. Wintock Draft. Wintock Draft is oh, first rate. Um, uh, yeah, it's better than VB. <laughs> Buck. I'm not going to say anything. I don't want to be machine gunned about. I had a VB and I was machine gunned on YouTube. I bought a six pack of VB. And I have never bought VB again. I thought it was okay. All right. I'm not going to say anything else. I don't want to get beaten up. Um, Okay, uh, I always thought you were going to do a 79 single cab build with a full canopy, longest chassis. Well, you know, mental four two, a 242 logger. All right, the 79 single cab has the same chassis as double cab. So it does has the longest. The single cab obviously has the longest load barrier, bay area. And when I did the Dream Tourer, I seriously considered it. But my trouble is, when I'm filming, I need to get stuff. And with a single cab, I've driven on, I've done several shoots using single cabs, and I find it so unbelievably frustrating not being able to get to my cameras easier, easily. I have a place in the trippy between seats up here, and I grab stuff, okay? And uh, if I'm traveling alone, obviously on the seat as well. Uh, if I travel alone in a double cab, I could do that but there's no place to put anything cameras and binoculars and things like that there's just nowhere in a single cab and it's the single biggest thing because honestly I thought about it I, I and I looked at some can of campers and I thought that that on a I really did look at it hard and decided to go with the dream tour concept which didn't work well for other reasons mainly because the camper I chose didn't give me the living in, live in stroke out ability that I was hoping it might. That was the main reason. 
but the chassis conversion worked well and uh, there's nothing wrong with the canopy the canopy was fine it was very nicely done very nicely built but it didn't quite fit in actually it wasn't there was no real big advantage it was much more comfortable to sleep in than a troop carrier but it was not more comfortable to live in out of than a troop carrier and it was a much bigger vehicle and I had the chassis extension and I didn't think it was a great way of I didn't as you know float my boat and so I sold it a little earlier than I might have and but um vomit bombs maybe <laughs> yeah yeah I mean okay okay <clears throat> here's a donation for a case of beer please make a video with the beer of your choice all right crash protocol thank you again I will I will go and get myself probably some of the um that amber nectar I call little creatures um you love that gold color of the Dream Tourer. It was it was beautiful. It really was beautiful. And did you see it in real real life, Buck? I'm not sure if you did. Uh, we met, didn't we meet in WA at some stage? We did. Anyway, in real life, it looked better than it did on video. That that gold color was was stunning. I've actually been looking at what to do with the current troop carrier, and I've got a couple of ideas that I think will make it look really something special. Um, that review coming out soon of the new of the new Troopy and the 2.8 Auto. <clears throat> uh, do you ever use roof nets in your cab? I've used roof nets in several vehicles that I've owned. I remember on my 105, both my 105s had roof nets. Uh, great for towels, jackets, blankets and um, they're up and out of the way that area in the back of a, of, a, of a station wagon in the back you open the back and you, you know in that area at the top it's not used for anything and i had roof nets so i found, I found them very useful um have you had a coke y3000 it's got ai technology don't know what you're talking about there uh, are you doing a rear axle extension correction on the new troop carrier? Um, that's a very good question because I haven't decided. So obviously the best option is still the multi-drive uh, true tracker conversion. It's um, thanks Buck. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Is the true tracker. But can you do it with wheel, wheel rims alone? Can you do it legally with wheel rims? rims alone so here's a question with a vehicle in wa what are the rules and what are the rules with the vehicle in victoria northern australia or south australia they're not the same rules so i'm doing a bit of investigations in that because i want to try and find a way of doing it at much lower cost using rims alone what are the ramifications of that you can't use spaces can you do it with rims alone to a point you can and that's what I'm trying to investigate. I'm trying to learn a little bit more about that. So I haven't got a... And back for a six-pack. Right, I'm not buying VB. What pack? What six-pack do you want me to buy, Buck? <clears throat> Kazakhstan. I've seen the pictures of Kazakhstan mountains and snow. Yeah, it does. Some of those Asian countries look stunning. Again... You know, if you're in Kazakhstan and you've got a fully equipped four-wheel drive and you want me to come and do a shoot wherever you are, I need support in a vehicle, I'll come and do a shoot. Always finding a vehicle is always the most biggest challenge with going to these wonderful places that I really want to go and shoot shows. Getting a vehicle there is the challenge. What do you guys think of the high ace conversion? All right, what do you think? So very briefly, if you haven't watched the, uh, I made it, put a video out why I, the real reason why I bought a 2.8 troop carrier, and that is that uh, in February we um, ordered a, a high ace, and it's arriving. In fact, it might have even already arrived. Everybody's been still closed for Christmas, but and it's going to a place called Pilbara Motor Group. They're fitting a product called Bus 4x4 High Ace Four Wheel Drive Conversion. It is based on a lot of Land Cruiser 200 running gear. It has their own sub-assembly that holds the front axle, and it has full-time four-wheel drive and same 2.8 engine and a permanent full-time full four-wheel drive, 
with a center locking differential and an optional rear locking differential which we are getting. It is a partnership between ourselves and bus 4 wheel bus 4x4 so it is a media partnership. We bought we bought the high ace they are donating the conversion and my job is to find out can the lump be cut out no peter it cannot be cut out not with these anyway because an exhaust pipe underneath it I'm talking about the grenadier um the it was my job to see okay how good is it going to be off-road so it, it's 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 like a troop carrier and then it is a van but it's a traditional van and it's far bigger than a troop carrier troop carrier is really really good for two people over land for four people ah oh, it's not that great you could actually do other things for four brilliant for two not great for four but the highest would be brilliant for four it's like a troopy but with four seats but it's not going to be as good off-road as a troopy but how good will it actually be i don't know only way i can find out is to get one so we are building one and we will present we yeah, and we're going to do a whole interior. We're going to do some very interesting electrical stuff on the interior. Completely out of the box thinking electrical. Very, very new stuff that we are um, working with Heiner Klarman from Klarman Automotive and Egon. And we together are working on some very interesting products which we will showcase in that high ace. So, um, okay, and that that... Right, so he, he, great question. SARS23, great question. How do you stay productive and how do you not get burnt out by managing your YouTube channel? All right, it's a very, very insightful question because you obviously understand how much work it is. You must understand, though, that I love the work. I love building four-wheel drives. I love the subject. I can't wait to get to Africa. My beautiful blue 1HZ Troopy is uh, waiting for its, its wheels. Its tires have arrived. It'll be fitting wheels and tires. And I cannot wait to get into that vehicle and do a trip and share it with you. I love doing it. How do I not burn out? There has been several times where I have almost burnt out. And I've had to say, well, I need to manage my time better. I still do all my own editing. And the trouble is with me is that I am, I'm a, I, I probably do editing better than anything else. As a result of that, getting another editor in, I mean, even the guy called Steph in South Africa, who's filming the, the um, South African build, and he's doing some edits for me. And there's nothing wrong with his edits. They're good. I don't use them. I'm just, I've just, I've been editing for so long. I have a particular style that I like. So I do my own editing. And I will sometimes use his edit and tweaks it, tweak, tweak it a bit. And, but, but I, but I, but I, that, but, but I do that because I love doing that. I love the editing. And most of the editing, I love doing it. So I understand that burnout is an issue. And if I, it's one of the reasons, again, why I sold my V8 Trippy. It was a motivator. That V8 Trippy, the grey one, was probably the best build I've ever done in my life. It was brilliant. I sold it because this is my business and I had kind of run out of things to talk about and showcase and because I'd run and I, I, there, was a, there was a burnout thing. I, I, let's do another vehicle and, and show it off and, and present it, keeping my interest up keeping burnout away so and that's on a Sunday I'm it's a Sunday afternoon at 3 p.m. and I'm doing a live show I love the subject I don't do it for the money I love the subject the bill business and all of the other YouTube yes that's that's earns income for me and it and it provides for my family yes it does but it's uh, it, I think it's the love of the subject that keeps me going to be honest with you and um, and I, the the haters on on YouTube now um, I scan through and I read a good proportion of comments on my videos a good proportion I, I read every single Patreon comment without fail but I, I often I scan through and um, if if I smell hate bang cancel you cannot 
comment on my channel again if I smell it. I just have to have a whiff of it. Because they're personal attacks. They're not attacking. When somebody attacks me personally, bang, you're gone. If you attack what I'm saying by saying I completely disagree with you, Andrew, and you propose why you think that way, and I love it, I'll engage. And if I tell you I think you're talking rubbish, I will say so, but I will engage. There's nothing wrong with saying I disagree with you, but don't criticize my height or my hair or something personal about me. Oh, he's just this. Bye-bye. So the number of people, the number of haters, not that often anymore. I decided that it's my channel and I can decide what goes on my channel. All right. Um, there was a good, there was quick, excited to see the high S. Um, uh, if there are anybody that's contributed that I haven't got to your question, tell me now because I think I've got to everybody's question that has contributed to this uh, on the super chats. Okay. High S is versus Delica. You can't get the Delica in, um, in Australia, so I can't do a, a combination. And the old Delica is a lot smaller than the high S. And a uh, very similar drivetrain, really, if you think about it, independent front suspension. Um, so I'm not going to do a comparison because it's not a fair comparison. The highest is going to be better. Uh, but the Delica is a really, really interesting vehicle. It actually has the underpinnings of the, I think it's the third generation Pajero, which is the Pajero I really liked. It was, I think, the fourth and, four, fourth and fifth that I didn't like. Um, uh, 224 Prado coming out. Uh, it's damn good looking, isn't it? Man, that's good looking. Their interior. Toyota finally woken up to their interior of their Prado, which is hideous. They've now made it. I think it's beautiful. Love it. Um, what happened to my planned East Africa trip through Kenya in Ethiopia? Equator 88 had to cancel it because we could not get visas. No visas. We would not be allowed to film. I'm not going in there as a tourist with a camera snappy snappy. I'm going in there with some fairly serious equipment. And uh, I'm not going in there just as a tourist. I'm going, I have to, a journalist, I'm a journalist. And you have to be honest. In places like that, you are honest with, with how you declare what you're doing. Couldn't get a visa. So, real pity. I was trying, I was waiting, I was ready to buy air tickets. We'd put the time aside. <clears throat> Very frustrating. Um, oh, Northern Territories. So, hey, Canada, Northern Territories. Can somebody please help me with a, 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 a van of sorts? When I say van, the reason why I say van is that if I'm going to explore Canada, Northern Territories, I have to be protected from the weather. You can't go camping and have the the flies in summer and the freezing cold weather in winter if you don't have some way of getting out of the environment and being relatively comfortable. So you need some kind of van. And if somebody can loan me a van, I will be in North, I will be in Canada in a shot. It's at the top of my, but that and, and, and I, the same goes for South America particularly Chile, Argentina. If you can do that for me, I will be there in a shot. Honestly, the vehicle is the problem. It's always the vehicle. I don't need anything fancy, anything. I need a self-contained vehicle that I can live in of, in, out, in and out of. And it, obviously it's got to be reliable and that kind of thing, but I'm not asking for fancy, fancy. I don't need that. I need a certain level of comfort and protection against the weather. I'll be there in a shot. Can't wait. And if you do, contact me, contact me via, not through messaging through YouTube. It's hopeless. I will not get it. There's a good chance I won't get it. Go to forexoverland.com, scroll to the bottom. There's a contact page there. You can fill in the contact page. I should mention now, since um, somebody said Kenya is now visa-free since 1st of January. Interesting. Mm, didn't know that. Didn't know that. Mm, okay. So, 
those vehicles, if they're available to me, we can work together. Contacted me through uh, the, the, the contact page on Forex Overland. The contact page, I do ignore people that say, uh, what suspension do you suggest I put on my Lada Neva? I'm sorry, I can't answer those questions. I do, if you're a Patreon and ask me those questions, I'll answer you. If you're a general YouTuber, sorry. I, and that page is actually vetted via an assistant that um, vets out all the hate. I don't even get to see it. Uh, I don't get that much of it, but it, every now and again something comes through and I'm told about it. I don't even see it. Um, yes, Saudi Arabia, again, same problem. I'd go to Saudi Arabia if I could get a vehicle. But the same thing is that I find, and it might be to do with my age, I the, the fact that you know, I build a troopie because you can live in and out of it and I can then sustain myself over a long period of time and really not not worry worry about um if I can sustain myself over a long period of time I can do a meaningful shoot and then the investment and time and money of getting there is made worth it. I find travelling in North America quite frustrating because I because I don't have a vehicle, I find myself checking into hotels. I can't stand hotels. Really they just I'm just not interested in hotels. Only hotel in my life that I've really enjoyed, really enjoyed, was the Palace Downtown Dubai as a guest of Sheikh Hamad. And that was great fun, fantastic food. And we were part of Dubai. Dubai is this glitzy, fantastic place that is so wonderful. And that was great fun. That that was. But general hotels no, don't interest me. Honestly, I don't. I, I'd rather be in the bush with trees, you know, cook something for myself, listen to the birds, honestly. And and uh, so that's my frustration with traveling in North America. Not the right vehicle. Okay, Bushcraft, I've been watching you for years. Just want to say thank you, good health to you and your family, keep doing what you do. I thank you, Bushcraft, for your, your contribution. It is much appreciated. Um, uh, I click that. Yes, I click that. Uh, that's my thank you click. I've just learned about that. Okay. Uh, pity no one ever comes to Mongolia. I don't have a vehicle to loan out. Yeah, Mongolia. Another one. On the, on the list, man. Need a vehicle. Why don't you go to Russia? Amazing 4x4 adventure and very tough. I was once invited by a guys come guys in Russia that wanted to I was so tempted it was about four years ago they wanted me to drive with them in a vehicle that they had built and it was like a six-seater four-wheel drive and they were going into the Arctic Circle and they were all Russians and I thought to myself you know I'm so tempted but that is so far out of my comfort zone and I would be completely reliant on them for my survival. It just wasn't a natural fit for me to be able to say, here, I'm giving you my, I'm putting my life in your hands. When I do trips with other people and it's their trip and I'm following along, and that doesn't happen often, but it has happened. Um, I, it never goes well. And as Paul, you've answered, you've asked, uh, I'll, I'll get to your question now. It never goes well because they have their agenda and I have an agenda and my agenda is, well, I want to make content. So that's my primary agenda. If I don't have an agenda, make content, then how can I make it as part of my business? I'm in the content business. So if I'm doing a trip, I'm making content. So two conflicting agendas and that's why they don't work. So if I do a trip and somebody wants to come along, I have to say, is my trip. They are definitely contributing to it. They're involved in the decision making. Yes. But the primary reason for being there is building is creating my content. And it sounds selfish, but at the same time, it's my business. So you understand what I'm saying? So I have to do that. And I've been on a couple of trips where I've been very frustrated because I thought I can't do content here. That's that's uh, and and therefore the reason going there has then changed. Tao, thank you very much for your contribution. I appreciate it. What is your recommended overlanding vehicle in Australia for four to five people? Converted highest doesn't count. Converted highest doesn't count. 
Again, what kind of overlanding do you want to do? How extreme is the overlanding you want to do? It's, it's very difficult to answer that question. But what would I do? I would I'd say, well, maybe you're going to have to pull a trailer. And your accommodation can be two ground tents or roof tent on the vehicle and a roof tent on the trailer if you want to sleep in roof tents. If you are doing a kind of overlanding trip that means that you are spending quite a lot of time in one place, then perhaps ground tents are going to be a little bit better, more convenient, lighter on your vehicle, not as they don't take up all the space on the roof rack, it's trouble with a rooftop tent then where do you put the jerry cans? So what vehicle are you carrying? Do you need extra jerry cans? Depending on the range. If you need extra jerry cans, then you need space on the roof rack perhaps or on the trailer. So if you do have a trailer, you're going to put the, 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 the extra fuel in the trailer. And if it's a four to five, four to five people, then you want a comfortable, um, hey, what would I recommend? What would I buy? Depending on the kind of trips you do. Any of going to do it, but not for five people. Remember the person in the middle if it's not a small child, it's going to complain all the time because that's a stupid lump. So it's a four-seater. So Toyota, new Toyota Prado. There you go. <clears throat> There's my recommendation. New Toyota Prado in 2024, pulling a light, simple off-road trailer. Are you carrying a water, an extra bit of extra fuel? That's probably what I would recommend. I hope how that helps. If you've got a little bit more to spend, Land Cruiser 300. Probably what I would say. Paul is saying wagon is the best vehicle. Need a caravan or camper or to complement no dust ingress. Yes, wagon is the best vehicle. He's talking about station wagon being the best vehicle. Best vehicle for what? Because you're carrying a lot of stuff. Station wagon is not the best vehicle. If you're carrying a lot of stuff, then a ute is best because you just have that much more stuff in the bag. So, dust egress yeah, depends on the kind of camper topper you've got some are very dust proof and others are very uh, let in a great deal of dust any with a bin back with a drop down included in the canopy get a lot of dust inside almost impossible there are some conversions that you can get rid of that dust but very difficult uh, finally get to say hello lucky i am up thanks for all your work love the channel christian thank you Pre appreciate uh paul said have tried to go to forks overland can't be reached at the moment just to let you know what you cannot be serious that doesn't make any sense at all no there it is it's up forksoverland.com it's up and running there's nothing wrong with it uh remember it's forksoverland.com not dot com dot au right um Whew, I'm going to wrap this up in 15 minutes, but I've got lots of people involved. How many views? We've had 3,600 and we've got 400 and 414 current viewers. And um, most people have been around for over 15 minutes. So that's right. Add Peru to South America list. Oh, I know. Peru, Argentina, Peru, Bolivia. I mean, really, just amazing. I want to go to Lake Titicaca. That, of course, is the highest lake in the world, if I'm correct, and it is in Peru. Um, I know that because my father went there many years ago and sent pictures back from Lake, T lake Titicaca. Um, is this a live broadcast or a rare... Tyler, this is a live broadcast, and I do a one live per month. And I try and choose a comment, uh, a, a subject, that I've had lots of comments on, and then I comment on the comments, which I've done this today about the Enios Grenadier, and now we're just talking about general stuff. And um, checking in from the UK, looking forward to both builds this year, more importantly, your Africa trip. Yeah, so looking forward to my Africa trip. So I talk a little bit about my Africa trip. The idea is that I'm doing a solo trip across the Kalahari. I'm going to a place called um, Mabusu Hube which is in the, deep in the Kalahari, lion country. Whether there are lions there now when I'm going there, I don't know, but it's very, very wild. And then uh, crossing a little bit more of the Kalahari and then Gwyn will be flying in to either Maun or Kasani or Livingston, that part of Botswana, and then we're going into 
Zambia, where I will be showing her the lower, lower um, South Luangwa National Park and driving the length of Lake Malawi in the new cruiser that is happening April, May. Uh, uh, you like the Ineos was not a fan during uh, during test drive no speedometer in front of you on middle of dash and the gas pedal was very thin and awkward position was left hand drive I got used to those things in the right hand side I didn't it didn't worry me it was one of those design quirks Remember the X Trail had that, and a few other vehicles have had that that I've driven. It doesn't didn't worry me those instruments on the in the middle, really. Some people would be off-putting, but it didn't didn't particularly worry me. I it had something in the middle, and I don't ne I didn't think that what was in the middle was should have been in the middle, and I thought some of what was there should have been in the middle, and some was there should have been there. But but anyway, I got I kind of got used to it. What do you think about the 2022 200 series? You mean the 300 series? You mean the 120 or the two? You're talking about the uh, Stan, are you talking about the oh, the 220 200 series? Should I keep it or upgrade? Oh, I can't tell you. It's a it's Land Cruiser 200 series. Should you upgrade it? What's wrong with it? Is it fulfilling your mission? Or just just feel like a new car? 300 is not really any better. No split cow, cow, tailgate on the 300, eh? No split tailgate. It was a big thing about the 200. Had a split tailgate. Took it out of the 300. Worst idea ever. Just that simple design thing of a drop-down tailgate. Just a simple thing. Makes such a difference on how you live with the car. I have a one eight one X1H. Love it. I don't know what a one X one H is, Paul. Um, uh, HZ one is the Toyota four point two engine, so I'm not sure what the X one H is. Uh, I'm going to scan through these and then <clears throat> morning from South Africa. Anton, hello, Tyler. Wow, I'm a huge fan. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Pum Pumbana. Appreciate it. Uh, what are your views on the Mahindra Scorpio and have you driven it? Love your videos. Okay, quick one, Cheval. What is great value for money? Haven't driven the latest one. And I had one on the cover of one of my books once and it was the worst idea ever because it was the only book that I'd ever produced that we did not sell the full consignment because we would, we, would, we would print 5,000 at a time. It was the only book ever of all my books that after two years I had not sold all of them it's because of the Mahindra on the cover because it wasn't a popular vehicle. People look at it and thought, can't be serious. Great value for money, that incredibly noisy diesel engine, but I'm sure they've changed it. That was in, my guess, 2005. So it's really a long time ago. Um, <clears throat> I, yeah, I don't have enough experience to really give you a, a good, um, go and speak to, or go and look at John Ruth's channel. I trust John, straight guy. He's got a Mahindra Scorpio. Stan, with Grenadier, the lump really pissed me off. I had a feel of it at 4x4 Expo earlier this year. Also, by the time you fit it out with your 4x4 gear, price range gets very close to 200000 Yes, it's gear is expensive. So no matter what car you've got, it's going to cost a lot. The, the, the Ineos gear is not cheap. It's uh, what I, From what I've seen of it, it's pretty nice. Um, it's an expensive, it's a luxury four-wheel drive. Um, and that you said the lump really annoyed you. Yeah. It annoys most, but not all people that drive it. And as I said, those people who have got the car don't shout it from the rooftops because, well, they've invested all that money in the car and they just decided, well, I'm just going to live with it. And if it's that bad, they're not going to shout it from the rooftops. They're just going to sell the car and be very quiet about it because they want to sell the car. It's the same with anything. It's not just I mean, any any car you buy and you decide, oh, I don't like this thing. You're not going to shout it from the youth top. So you're just going to be quiet about it and, and sell it and then rant about it. So, and I'm not hearing a lot of people, and that's why I'm not hearing a lot of people saying they've got a Grenadier and that, and that lump 
really annoys them because they're keeping quiet about it. Or they're just saying, well, I must get used to it. I must just get used to it. And many, many of them will. Um, uh, just learned of the new emission regulations here in Australia. Apparently my uh, ZI is not meeting proposed. Yeah, requirements may be retrospectively applied to all vehicles. Applied to retrospectively of all vehicles in 2028, 20, old and new. I don't believe that. I drive a 1975 Range Rover and that is a missions horror story. I'm allowed to drive it. <coughs> don't believe that for a moment. I don't drive it a lot, but I don't believe that that retro thing. Uh, Australia is a bit behind with the red with the emissions thing compared to the rest of the world. It is. For your African travels, do you carry beer spray, lion spray if it exists, or an old reliable Lee Enfield or wildlife for wildlife protection? No. I carry pepper spray and it's not for the animals and um, yes yeah, like bear spray pepper 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 spray so no and for wild animals one you the weapon you use for wild animals is your brain uh, wild animals are not an issue you use your brain and then they're not an issue um, so uh, what am I going to do with a rifle they have st such strict poaching laws. If I was caught with an illegal firearm in a game reserve in Botswana, I would be locked up for 10 years. They do not know, honestly. And as a result, poaching is not a serious problem in Botswana. They are very, very hard. I know somebody who was driving, those of you who know Botswana, were driving the the what is that road called? It's a cut line that goes from Nata, from the Na, from Naipan up to Pandamatenga. It's a bush track. What's it called? I'm thinking about doing it this time. Seriously thinking about doing it this time. What's it called? It's a, it's a very, very, I noticed somebody was driving it and he said, he was driving along and he saw a helicopter over the top of him and the helicopter turned around and settled in front in front of him he stopped like this helicopter hovered a bit hovered a bit moved a bit towards him and came down very very slowly landed right in front of him on, on the track and he said there was just dust flying everywhere and he just okay sat there and um two soldiers got out and um the botswana defense force said hello sir and i've had some i was going to say, use the word altercations wrong word I've had some experience dealing with Botswana Defence Force. And he said, um, uh, where are you going? I said, I'm going up to Kasani. And he said, where have you come from? Do you mind if I search or we search your vehicle? And you'd never object. And he said, no, we just had some poachers in the area. We thought you might have been the poachers. And they took off again. Yeah. He would have, if, that had been, if he had had me carrying a firearm, he would never, have, he probably would have told the story 10 years later. Uh, is cooking with charcoal feasible here in Australia? Here in Australia? You mean there in Australia? You would know it. So there are fire bans. Um, yeah, you can buy charcoal. You can buy all of that kind of thing. The, the fire ban season, we are in a fire ban season in Australia now. You cannot even cook in your home with a fire outside okay my brother for example was he uh, lives in the near the perth hills and uh, he had just moved into his home and he was he had a he's got a he's got a, uh, a pizza oven and he was making some pizzas and he had a knock on the door and, and a guy said to him um yeah that's not that's a fire yeah but it's a no he said no we saw the smoke he said no they were very reasonable. They said, please understand, no fire bans means no naked flames, period. Anywhere outside, none. It's that serious because the fire risks in Australia is unbelievable. The destructive nature of fires here is, so we, we will use a small gas cooker on our vehicle and um, 
but we won't put it in a pit. We'll we'll have it on a vehicle on, but but no fires means no fires. N nothing at all like that. You can use a gas cooker in an enclosed space, but any kind of fire of any nature is out of the question. So so yeah, we use we use fire lighters and, and briquettes, what they call them, what charcoal and things. Yes, we do but we adhere so strictly to the fire ban. <coughs> uh, you say you're thinking of fitting wheels on your 2.8 to fix the width. Curious, have you considered building a steel wheel with exact offset needed to match the front? No space needed. So you can buy uh, wheels with the offset to correct it. I have looked into this now and I can put in a for, um, it's a 40 it's a negative 41 offset zero for offset on the front negative 48 all I need is negative 50 for it to be exact negative 48 on the back I'll be two I think it was two mil out was it six mil out I can't remember exact my exact numbers but I've been looking at it so I can correct that that width uh, to to within easily within 10 millimeters using available rims but the question is is it legal that's the question in different states it appears to be different so I'm digging down that trying to find out exactly um, <clears throat> progress on the African troop carrier uh, Anton um, I've got two videos coming out in February and another two in March and we have fitted a rear uh, a rear bar, beautiful rear bar by Gobi X. We have fitted a front bull bar uh, from Onka, and the interior is being built uh, by Paul. And uh, he's basically building it based on what he does with troop carriers. It's kind of a standard kit that he's doing with some modifications for me. And that is being the build on that is actually starting this month, and those vi videos will come out on and uh, it'll be all ready at the end of March. It'll be finished. <clears throat> okay, uh, Corradetti. Um, yeah, thank you. I'll be in touch with you on uh, tomorrow. Um, back to work full time tomorrow. So um, I'm so sorry for your oppression in land down under. CA, I don't know what you're talking about. I have no idea what you're talking about. You must be reading some... You must be reading some bullshit somewhere. Okay, uh, what are your thoughts on utilizing lithium power bank versus installing complete dual battery system? Well, I did a video on that, Luke. Go back. I posted a video on that on, and I talk about exactly that. And I posted it. I think it was November. Go and have a look. I explain everything. Power banks. I explain everything. How they can be used as a split charge system, as a standalone system. I do the whole thing. So go and have a check there. That is also on the Overland Workshop for those of you who are part of the Overland Workshop. That is there as well. Um, Yes, yeah, some places have banned freestanding barbecues. Y you know, the the fire thing in Western Australia also relies on certain level of um, common sense, and uh, yeah, just you if if you ha if you were the cause of a big fire, you could go to prison for ten years because they are so unbelievably destructive and so easy to prevent. All you have to do is want to. Um, yes, it's a good point, actually. No chainsaws are allowed on, fa on, on, on fire ban days. You are not allowed to use motor lawnmowers or chainsaws because of sparks. Very good point. Very, very good point. Um, Uh, Stan talking about solar generators in the market. So my video is about solar generators, solar things. It's it's, it's quite an quite a in-depth look at these products. 
couple of examples and several use case samples of these standalone systems. Um, Pleb, Andrew, long ago my father, grandfather bought a 2012 Fortuna, but we didn't know how to offer it. My grandfather listened to all your advice and have six years of fun. Thanks. Now, the early Fortuna. I had my, I did my Fortuna review. I think it would have been in, I measure it on what quality video I was shooting. It would have been early HD 2007. I did a, a Neurectus Felt 2007, 2008. I did a, a a test of the Fortuna. Loved the Fortuna. As a light four-wheel drive, I, it was great. It was it was really really very impressive car. Liked it a lot. But it's a light duty four-wheel drive. But for family four-wheel drive outings and it's great. I'm going to wind this up now. Have you ever considered moving to live in the United States? We have much more freedom than in Aussie land. Define freedom, mate. Define freedom. Okay, define freedom. We are very, very free here in Australia. So, no, cut the bullshit. Just cut it, okay? You're just feeding off bullshit stories about freedom in Australia and lack. And you think you've got freedom in, in the United States. Don't get me started. You know, you think you've got freedom because that's the way it's presented to you. And you think Australia hasn't got freedom because it's the way, of the way it's presented to you. Living here... We have complete freedom. So don't go there. Right. How do you get hold of these internal water tanks from Paul Marsh showing on the Africa thing? Okay, Tyler, I am. Um, oh, dear, what's going on here? Don't do that. Um, you need to contact Paul Marsh. Just contact him. Paul Marsh 4x4 and ask him about the tanks. Uh, I hope to order a troop carrier this year. I've got to thank you for that. I want to do a roof conversion, long distance travel. Would you recommend a Workmate or a GL? Do you want electric windows? Do you want electric windows with a Workmate or GL? That's your question. Um, are you willing to spend the extra money for electric windows? And a bit of chrome. <coughs> there you go, you decide. All right, California, we can't do fires most of the summer. Um, yeah, the freedom thing with the fires is just nonsense because you're protecting other people. It's not that you don't have freedom to make fires. You don't have the freedom to burn down other people's properties. That's what you don't have freedom to do. <clears throat> uh, um, Andrew, do you think about the, the Nissan Pathfinder? Um, I've never loved the Pathfinder. I don't think it's a particularly good vehicle, the Pathfinder. The Pathfinder that I did drove and I, I did drive it and did a test. It was very media, media. It was a first, it was a, I think it was a second generation Pathfinder. Still see some of them are driving around. And I thought it was mm, good engine, off-road, mediocre. I didn't, didn't particularly like it. Uh, <clears throat> Jet boil is the way to go. Shall I tell you, Chandler, the jet boil is fantastic. You know what's even better? It's twice the price, though. MSR reactor. Even better. It doesn't have a self-clicker, though, but it's even faster. I only say that because I've got one, and that's just one of my favorite pieces of kit. It's basically a jet boil that's a bit more efficient. <laughs> yeah, really make a big difference. But anyway, it's one of my pieces of equipment that I really like. Is that the only difference between the models? Uh, thanks for your reply. Uh, it's got Chrome on the GXL. It's got electric windows. Um, you'll have to look at the website. It's the main thing. Honestly, it's the main thing. You know, and here's the, here's the deal. Electric windows, you might not think is a big thing. You're sitting in the troopy. The winder is right where your right knee is. So your knee rubs against the winder. It's at exactly the wrong place. So the electric, the electric thing, I'll pay GX, I'll just buy it. 
I want electric windows. It's not so much the electric windows, it's that flaming winder. It's in such a stupid place. <clears throat> there you go. I hope to see the highest with a kitchen, like a tear, like a teardrop tailor with a slide out fridge, bed in the back, but can't look out the back. Front seats must be able to turn around with the table. You're reading my mind, Craig. Um, Abel D, you are misinformed, mate. We can own a Lee Enfield. Do some research, mate. As Andrew said, you are misinformed. You can buy guns in Australia. You can own guns in Australia. <clears throat> the difference is they know who has got the guns. Ah, uh, Pleb Kruger, what would you say is the next best option to a Fortuna if you are looking for something more fuel efficient with more space? More fuel efficient. Same space inside, but pretty reliable and can do the same off-roading. A new Fortuna. You want more fuel efficient and same space. Fortuna is pretty good on fuel. Its fuel tank was too small. was one of its problems. Freedom, I don't get a knock on my door for criticizing our government or INEOS. Who gets a knock? I don't want this to become political. Who gets a knock on your door for criticizing INEOS? Who gets a, who gets knocked on their door? This is not North Korea. No, stop it, guys. Stop it. Stop it. Abel? Abel? And Paul? Stop it. You're all talking bullshit, and this has become political, and I'm closing this down because of you guys. You want to ruin your life by listening to, to and, and, and watching stupid people with, uh, uh, with, with bullshit stories about freedom in different countries. Oh, my country's better than you because we have more freedom because we can't criticize a car. Where the hell did you get that from? Thank you. I, Australia is a bloody wonderful place to live in. Okay, absolutely flipping fantastic and I love it here. Right, I'm going to say goodbye and thank you for all of those people that commented. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I don't make comments political, guys. This is not the place for it. Not the place. I'll ban you from commenting in a heartbeat if you try and make political your political agenda on my channel. That's not, we're here to go off-roading, overlanding, and love our four-wheel drives. We're not about to get immersed into the shit that travels around on social media because so much of it is absolute bullshit misinformation just to stir hatred and separate people that's the agenda what we do here is we join people together in a love of off-roading and four-wheel drives and we argue about what's better solid axles or independent that's what we argue about there you go thank you so much Again, everybody, I'm off to enjoy the rest of my sunny Sunday afternoon here in Western Australia. Thank you again for those who contributed. See you next time. Bye for now.